Act One of The Country Wife by William Witcherly. Scene London. Prologue. Poets, like cudgelled bullies, never do, at first or second blow, submit to you, but will provoke you still, and ne'er have done, till you are weary first with laying on. The late so baffled scribbler of this day, though he stands trembling, bids me boldly say, what we before most plays are used to do, for poets out of fear first draw on you. In a fierce prologue the still pit defy, and, ere you speak, like Castril, give the lie. But though our bays battles oft I fought, and with bruised knuckles their dear conquests bought, nay, never yet feared odds upon the stage, in prologue dare not Hector with the age, but would take quarter from your saving hands, though bays within all yielding countermands says you confederate wits no quarter give therefore his play shan't ask your leave to live well let the vain rash fop by huffing so think to obtain the better terms of you but we the actors humbly will submit now and at any time to a full pit nay often we anticipate your rage and murder poets for you on our stage we set no guards upon our tiring room but when with dying colours there you come we patiently you see give up to you our poets virgins nay our matrons too act the first scene one horner's lodging enter horner and quack following him at a distance horner aside <laughs> A quack is as fit for a pimp as a midwife for a bawd. They are still but in their way both helpers of nature. Aloud. Well, my dear doctor, hast thou done what I desired? I have undone you for ever with the women, and reported you throughout the whole town as bad as a eunuch, with as much trouble as if I had made you one in earnest. But have you told all the midwives you know, the orange wenches at the playhouses, the city husbands, and old fumbling keepers of this end of the town? For they'll be the readiest to report it. I have told all the chambermaids, waiting women, tire women, and old women of my acquaintance, nay, and whispered it as a secret to them, and to the whisperers of Whitehall, so that you need not doubt twill spread and you will be as odious to the handsome young women as as the smallpox well and to the married women of this end of the town as as the great one nay as their own husbands and to the city dames as aniseed robin of oh, filthy and contemptible memory and they will frighten their children with your name especially the females and cry horner's coming to carry you away i am only afraid twill not be believed you told him it was by an english french disaster and an english french chirurgeon who has given me at once not only a cure but an antidote for the future against that damned malady and that worse distemper love and all other women's evils your late journey into france has made it the more credible and your being here a fortnight before you appeared in public looks as if you apprehended the shame which i wonder you do not well i have been hired by young gallants to be liam t'other way but you are the first would be thought a man unfit for women dear mr doctor let vain rogues be contented only to be thought abler men than they are generally tis all the pleasure they have but mine lies another way you take me thinks a very preposterous way of it and as ridiculous as if we operators in physic should put forth bills to disparage our medicaments with hopes to gain customers doctor 
There are quacks in love as well as physic, who get but the fewer and worse patients for their boasting. A good name is seldom got by giving it oneself, and women, no more than honour, are compassed by bragging. Come, come, doctor, the wisest lawyer never discovers the merits of his cause to the trial, the wealthiest man conceals his riches, and the cunning gamester his play. Shy husbands and keepers, like old rooks, are not to be cheated, but by a new unpractised trick. False friendship will pass now no more than false dice upon him. No, not in the city. Enter boy. There were two ladies and a gentleman coming up. Exit. A pox! Some unbelieving sisters of my former acquaintance, who I am afraid, expect their sense should be satisfied to the falsity of the report. No, ah, this formal fool and women. Enter Sir Jasper Fidget, Lady Fidget, and Mrs. Dainty. His wife and sister. My coach breaking just now before your door, sir. I look upon as an occasional reprimand to me, sir for not kissing your hand sir since you're coming out of france sir and so my disaster sir has been my good fortune sir and this is my wife and sister sir what then sir my lady and sister sir wife this is master horner master horner husband my lady my lady fidget sir so sir won't you be acquainted with her sir aside so the report is true i find by his coldness or aversion to the sex but i'll play the wag with him aloud pray salute my wife my lady sir i will kiss no man's wife sir for him sir i have taken my eternal leave sir the sex already sir sir jasper aside <laughs> i'll plague him yet aloud not know my wife sir i do know your wife sir she's a woman sir and consequently a monster sir a greater monster than a husband sir a husband how sir so sir but i make no more cuckold sir makes horns <laughs> oh mercury mercury pray sir jasper let us be gone from this rude fellow. Who, by his breeding, would think he had ever been in France? For he's but too much a French fellow, such as hate women of quality and virtue for their love to their husbands. Sir Jasper, a woman is hated by him as much for loving her husband as for loving their money. But pray, let's be gone. You do well, madam, for I have nothing that you came for. I have brought over not so much as a body picture, no new postures, nor the second part of the Ecole de Fille, nor... Quack, apart to Horner. Hold for shame, sir. What do you mean? You'll ruin yourself forever with the sex. <laughs> he hates women perfectly, I find. What pity tis he should. Ay, he's a base fellow for it but affectation makes not a woman more odious to them than virtue because your virtue is your greatest affectation madam how you saucy fellow would you wrong my honour oh, if i could how do you mean sir <laughs> no he can't wrong your ladyship's honour upon my honour he poor man hark you in your ear a mere eunuch Oh, filthy French beast! Fo, fo, why do we stay? Let's be gone. I can't endure the sight of him. Stay, but till the chairs come. They'll be here presently. No, no. Nor can I stay longer. Tis, let me see, a quarter and a half quarter of a minute past eleven. The council will be sat. I must away. Business must be preferred always before love and ceremony with the wise, Mr. Horner. And the impotent, said Jasper. Ay, ay, the impotent, Master Horner. <laughs> what? Leave us with a filthy man alone in his lodgings? He's an innocent man now, you know. Pray stay. I'll hasten the chairs to you. 
mr horner your servant i should be glad to see you at my house pray come and dine with me and play at cards with my wife after dinner you are fit for women at the game yet <laughs> aside tis as much a husband's prudence to provide innocent diversion for a wife as to hinder her unlawful pleasures and he had better employ her than let her employ herself aloud farewell your servant sir jasper exit sir jasper i will not stay with him foe nay madam i beseech you stay if it be but to see i can be as civil to ladies yet as they would desire no no foe you cannot be civil to ladies you as civil as ladies would desire no 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 fo 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 exeunt lady fidget and mrs dainty fidget now i think i or you yourself rather have done your business with the women thou art an ass don't you see already upon the report and my carriage this grave man of business leaves his wife in my lodgings invites me to his house and wife who before would not be acquainted with me out of jealousy nay by this means you may be more acquainted with the husbands but the less with the wives let me alone if i can but abuse the husbands i'll soon disabuse the wives stay i'll reckon you up the advantages i am like to have by my stratagem first i shall be rid of all my old acquaintances the most insatiable sort of duns that invade our lodgings in a morning and next to the pleasure of making a new mistress is that of being rid of an old one and of all old debts love when it comes to be so is paid the most unwillingly well you may be so rid of your old acquaintances but how will you get any new ones doctor thou wilt never make a good chemist thou art so incredulous and impatient ask but all the young fellows of the town if they do not lose more time like huntsmen in starting the game than in running it down one knows not where to find him who will or will not women of quality are so civil you can hardly distinguish love from good breeding and a man is often mistaken but now i can be sure she that shows an aversion to me loves the sport as those women that are gone whom i warrant to be right and then the next thing is your women of honour as you call em are only chary of their reputations not their persons and tis scandal they would avoid not men now may i have by the reputation of a eunuch the privileges of one and be seen in a lady's chamber in a morning as early as a husband kiss virgins before their parents or lovers and may be in short the pass part two of the town now doctor nay now you shall be the doctor and your process is so new that we do not know but it may succeed <laughs> not so new neither probatum est doctor well i wish you luck and many patience whilst i go to mine exit enter harcourt and dorland come your appearance at the play yesterday has i hoped hardened you for the future against the women's contempt and the men's raillery and now you're abroad as you were wont did i not bear it bravely with the most theatrical impudence nay more than an orange wench's show there or a drunken visit mask or a great bellied actress nay or the most impudent of creatures an ill poet or what is yet more impudent a second-hand critic but what say the ladies have they no pity what ladies the visard masks you know never pity a man when all's gone though in their service and for the women in the boxes you'd never pity them when twas in your power they say tis pity but all that deal with common women should be served so nay i swear they won't admit you to play at cards with them go to plays with them or do the little duties which other shadows of men are wont to do for them what do you call shadows of men half men what boys 
Ah, your old boys, old beau garçons, who like superannuated stallions are suffered to run, feed, and whinny with the mares as long as they live, though they can do nothing else. Well, a pox on love and wenching. Women serve but to keep a man from better company. Though I can't enjoy them, I shall you the more. Good fellowship and friendship are lasting, rational and manly pleasures. For all that, give me some of those pleasures you call effeminate too. They help to relish one another. They disturb one another. No, mistresses are like books. If you pour upon them too much, they doze you and make you unfit for company. But if used discreetly, you are the fitter for conversation by em. A mistress should be like a little country retreat near the town. Not to dwell in constantly, but only for a night in a way. To taste the town the better when the man returns. I tell you, tis as hard to be a good fellow, a good friend and a lover of women, as tis to be a good fellow, a good friend and a lover of money. You cannot follow both and choose your side. Why gives you liberty? Love takes it away. Gad, he's in the right on it. Wine gives you joy. Love, grief and tortures, besides surgeons. Wine makes us witty. Love, only sots. Wine makes us sleep. Love breaks it. By the world he has reason, Harcourt. Wine makes... Aye, wine makes us... makes us princes. Love makes us beggars. Poor rogues, he cad. And wine. So, there's one converted. No, no. Love and wine. Oil and vinegar. I grant it, love will still be uppermost. Come. For my part, I will have only those glorious manly pleasures of being very drunk and very slovenly. Enter boy. Mr. Sparkish is below, sir. Exit. What, my dear friend? A rogue that is fond of me only, I think, for abusing him. No, he can no more think the men laugh at him than that women jilt him. His opinion of himself is so good. Well, there's another pleasure by drinking I thought not of. I shall lose his acquaintance because he cannot drink. And you know, it is a very hard thing to be rid of him, for he's one of those nauseous officers at wit, who, like the worst fiddlers, run themselves into all companies. One that, by being in the company of men of sense, would pass for one. And may so to the short-sighted world, as a false jewel amongst true ones is not discerned at a distance. His company is as troublesome to us as a cuckold's when you have a mind to his wife's. No, the rogue will not let us enjoy one another, but ravishes our conversation, though he signifies no more to it than St. Martin Marrow's gaping. An awkward thrumming upon the lute does to his man's voice and music. And to pass for a wit in town shows himself a fool every night to us that are guilty of the plot. Such wits as he are to a company of reasonable men like rooks to the gamesters, who only fill a room at the table, but are so far from contributing to the play that they only serve to spoil the fancy of those that do. Nay, they are used like rooks too. Snubbed, checked, and abused. Yet the rogues will hang on. A uh, pox on them, and all that force nature, and would be still what she forbids them. Affectation is their greatest monster. Most men are the contraries to that, they would seem. Your bully, you see, is a coward with a long sword. The little humbly fawning physician with his ebony cane, is he that destroys men? The usurer, a poor rogue, possessed of mouldy bonds and mortgages, a we they call spendthrifts are only wealthy, who lay out his money upon daily new purchases of pleasure. Ay, your errantest cheat is your trustee or executor, your jealous man the greatest cuckold, your churchman the greatest atheist, and your noisy pert rogue of a wit the greatest fop, dullest ass, and worst company as you shall see. Oh, for here he comes. Enter Sparkish. How is't, Sparks? How is't? Well, faith, Harry, I must rally thee a little. 
<laughs> upon the report in town of thee <laughs> i can't hold in faith shall i speak <laughs> yes but you'll be so bitter then honest dick and frank here shall answer for me i will not be extreme bitter by the universe we will be bound in a ten thousand pound bond he shall not be bitter at all nor sharp nor sweet what not downright insipid nay then since you are so brisk and provoke me take what follows you must know i was discoursing and rallying with some ladies yesterday and they happened to talk of the fine new signs in town very fine ladies i believe said i i know where the best new sign is where says one of the ladies in covent garden i replied said another in what street in russell street answered i lord says another i'm sure there was never a fine new sign there yesterday yes but there was said i again and it came out of france and has been there a fortnight ah oh, pox i can hear no more prithee no hear him out let him tune his crowd while the worst music the greatest preparation nay faith i'll make you laugh it cannot be says a third lady yes yes quoth i again says a fourth lady look to it we'll have no more ladies no then mark mark now said i to the fourth did you never see mr horner he lodges in russell street and he's a sign of a man you know since he came out of france ha 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 but the devil take me if thine be the sign of a jest with that they all fell a laughing till they pissed themselves what but it does not move you methinks well i see one had as good to go to law without a witness as break a jest without a laughter on one side come come sparks but where do we dine i have left at whitehall an earl to dine with you why i thought thou hadst loved a man with a title better than a suit with a french trimming to it go to him again no sir a wit to me is the greatest title in the world but go dine with your earl sir he may be exception we are your friends and will not take it ill to be left i do assure you nay faith he shall go to him nay pray gentlemen we'll thrust you out if you won't what disappoint anybody for us nay dear gentlemen hear me no no sir by no means pray go sir why dear rogues no no they all thrust him out of the room <laughs> re-enter sparkish but sparks pray hear me what do you think i'll eat then with gay shallow fops and silent coxcombs i think wit as necessary at dinner as a glass of good wine and that's the reason i never have any stomach when i eat alone come but where do we dine even where you will at chatelain's yes if you will or at the cock yes if you please or at the dog and partridge Ay, if you have a mind to it for we shall dine at neither pshaw with your foolin we shall lose the new play and i would no more miss seeing a new play the first day than i would miss sitting in the wits row therefore i'll go fetch my mistress and away exit enter pinchwife who have we here pinchwife gentlemen your humble servant well jack by thy long absence from the town the grumness of thy countenance and the slovenliness of thy habit i should give thee joy should i not of marriage pinchwife aside death does he know i'm married too i thought to have concealed it from him at least aloud my long stay in the country will excuse my dress when i have a suit of law that brings me up to town that puts me out of humour besides i must give sparkish to-morrow five thousand pounds to lie with my sister nay you country gentleman rather than not purchase will buy anything and he is a cracked title if we may quibble 
Well, but am I to give thee joy? I heard thou wert married. What then? Why, the next thing that is to be heard is, uh, thou art a cuckold. Pinchwife aside. Insupportable name. But I did not expect marriage from such a whore-master as you, one that knew the town so much, and women so well. Why, I have married no London wife. Pshaw! <laughs> That's a one. <laughs> that grey circumspection in marrying a country wife is like refusing a deceitful pampered Smithfield jade to go and be cheated by a friend in the country. Pinch wife aside. A pox on him in his simile. Aloud. At least we are a little surer of the breed there. No, what her keeping has been, whether foiled or unsound. <laughs> come, come. I have known a clap gotten in Wales, and there are cousins, justice clerks, and chaplains in the country. I won't say coachmen, but she is handsome and young. Pinch wife aside. I'll answer as I should do. Aloud. No, no, she has no beauty but her youth, no attraction but her modesty. Wholesome, homely, and housewifely, that's all. He talks as like a grazier as he looks. She's too awkward, ill-favoured, and um, silly to bring to town. Then methinks you should bring her to be taught breeding. To be taught? No, sir, I thank you. Good wives and private soldiers should be ignorant. I'll keep her from your instructions, I warrant you. Harcourt aside. The rogue is as jealous as if his wife were not ignorant. Why, if she be ill-favoured, there will be less danger here for you than by leaving her in the country. We have such variety of dainties that we are seldom hungry. But they always have coarse, constant, swinging stomachs in the country. Foul feeders indeed. And your hospitality is great there. Open house, every man's welcome. So, so, gentlemen. But prithee, why shouldst thou marry her? If she be ugly, ill-bred, and silly, she must be rich, then. As rich as if she brought me twenty thousand pound out of this town, for she'll be as sure not to spend her moderate portion as a London baggage would be to spend hers, let it be what it would. So, tis all one. Then, because she's ugly, she's the likelier to be my own, and, being ill-bred, She'll hate conversation, and, since silly and innocent, will not know the difference betwixt a man of one and twenty and one of forty. Nine, to my knowledge. But if she be silly, she'll expect as much from a man of forty-nine as from him of one and twenty. But methinks wit is more necessary than beauty, and I think no young woman ugly that has it, and no handsome woman agreeable without it. "'Tis my maxim. He's a fool that marries, but he's a greater that does not marry a fool. What is wit in a wife good for, but to make a man a cuckold? "'Yes, to keep it from his knowledge. "'A fool cannot contrive to make a husband a cuckold. "'No, but she'll club with a man that can. And what is worse, if she cannot make a husband a cuckold, she'll make him jealous and pass for one. And then tis all one.' Well, well, I'll take care for one. My wife shall make me no cuckold, though she had your help, Mr. Horner. I understand the town, sir. Dorland aside. His help. Harcourt aside. He's come nearly to town, it seems, and has not heard how things are with him. But tell me, has marriage cured thee of whoring, which it seldom does? Tis more than age can do. No, the word is, I'll marry and live honest. But a marriage vow is like a penitent gamester's oath, and entering into bonds and penalties to stint himself to such a particular small sum at play for the future, which makes him but the more eager, and not being able to hold out, loses his money again, and is forfeit to boot. Aye, aye, a gamester will be a gamester whilst his money lasts, and a whoremaster whilst his bigger. No, I've known them when they are broke and can lose no more. Keep a fumbling with the box in their hands to fool with only, and hinder other gamesters. That had wherewithal to make lusty stakes. Well, gentlemen, you may laugh at me, but you shall never lie with my wife. I know the town. But prithee, was not the way you were in better? Is not keeping better than marriage? 
<laughs> a pox aunt the jades would jilt me i could never keep a whore to myself so then you only marry to keep a whore to yourself well but let me tell you women as you say are like soldiers made constant and loyal by good pay rather than by oaths and covenants therefore i'd advise my friends to keep rather than marry since too i find by your example it does not serve one's turn for i saw you yesterday in the eighteenpenny place with a pretty country wench pinch wife aside how the devil did he see my wife then i sat there that she might not be seen but she shall never go to a play again oh, what dost thou blush at nine and forty for having been seen with a wench no faith i warrant twas his wife which he seated there out of sight for he's a cunning rogue and understands the town he blushes then twas his wife for men are now more ashamed to be seen with him in public than with a wench pinch wife aside hell and damnation i'm undone since horner has seen her and they know twas she <laughs> but prithee was it thy wife she was exceeding pretty i was in love with her at that distance you are like never to be nearer to her your servant gentlemen offers to go nay prithee stay i cannot i will not come you shall dine with us i've dined already come i know thou hast not i'll treat thee dear rogue i shan't spend none of thy hampshire money to-day pinch wife aside treat me so he uses me already like his cuckold nay you shall not go i must i have business at home exit to beat his wife he's as jealous of her as a cheapside husband of a covent garden wife why tis as hard to find an old whore-master without jealousy and the gout as a young one without fear or the pox as gout and age from pox and youth proceeds so wenching past then jealousy succeeds the worst disease that love and wenching breeds exeunt end of act one act two of the country wife by william witcherly scene one a room in pinchwife's house mrs marjorie pinchwife and alethea pinchwife peeping behind at the door pray sister where are the best fields and woods to walk in in london alethea aside a pretty question aloud why sister mulberry garden and st james's park and for close walks the new exchange pray sister tell me why my husband looks so grum here in town and keeps me up so close and will not let me go a-walking nor let me wear my best gown yesterday oh he's jealous sister jealous what's that he's afraid you should love another man uh, how should he be afraid of my loving another man when he will not let me see any but himself did he not carry you yesterday to a play i but we sat amongst ugly people he would not let me come near the gentry who sat under us so that i could not see him he told me none but naughty women sat there whom they toused and moused but i would have ventured for all that but how did you like the play indeed i was wary of the play but i liked hugely the actors they are the goodliest properest men sister oh but you must not like the actors sister i how should i help it sister pray sister when my husband comes in will you ask leave for me to go a-walking a-walking <laughs> oh lord a country gentlewoman's pleasure is the drudgery of a footpost and she requires as much airing as her husband's horses aside but here comes your husband i'll ask though i'm sure he'll not grant it he says he won't let me go abroad for fear of catching the pox fie the smallpox you should say enter pinchwife oh my dear dear bud welcome home why dost thou look so froppish who has nangered thee you're a fool mrs pinchwife goes aside and cries faith so she is for crying for no fault poor tender creature 
What? You would have her as impudent as yourself, as arrant as a jill flirt, a gadder, a magpie, and to say all, a mere notorious town woman? Brother, you are my only censurer, and the honour of your family will sooner suffer in your wife there than in me, though I take the innocent liberty of the town. Hark you, mistress, do not talk so before my wife, the innocent liberty of the town. Why, pray? Who boasts of any intrigue with me? What lampoon has made my name notorious? What ill women frequent my lodgings? I keep no company with any women of scandalous reputations. No, you keep the men of scandalous reputations company. Where? Would you not have me civil? Answer him in a box at the plays, in the drawing room at Whitehall, in St. James's Park, Mulberry Garden, or... Hold, hold! Do not teach my wife where the men are to be found. I believe she's the worse for your town documents already. I bid you, keep her in ignorance as I do. Indeed, be not angry with her, bud. She will tell me nothing of the town, though I ask her a thousand times a day. Then you are very inquisitive to know, I find. Not I, indeed, dear. I hate London. Our place house in the country is worth a thousand oft. Would I were there again? So you shall, I warrant. But were you not talking of plays and players when I came in? To Alethea. You are her encourager in such discourses. No, indeed, dear. She cheat me just now for liking the player men. Pinchwife, aside. Nay, if she be so innocent as to own to me her liking them, there is no hurt in't. Aloud. Come, my poor rogue, but thou likest none better than me. Yes, indeed, but I do. The player men are finer folks. But you love none better than me. You are my own dear bard, and I know you. I hate a stranger. Ay, my dear, you must love me only, and not be like the naughty town women, who only hate their husbands and love every man else, love plays, visits, fine coaches, fine clothes, fiddles, balls, treats, and so lead a wicked town life. Nay, if to enjoy all these things be a town life, London is not so bad a place, dear. How? If you love me, you must hate London. Alethea, aside. The fool has forbid me discovering to her the pleasures of the town, and he is now setting her agog upon them himself. But, husband, do the town women love the player men too? Yes, I warrant you. I, I warrant you. Why, you do not, I hope. No, no, but, but why have we no player men in the country? Ha, Mrs. Minx, ask me no more to go to a play. Nay. Why, love? I did not care for going, but when you forbid me, you make me, as twere, desire it. Alethea, aside. So it will be in other things, I warrant. Pray let me go to a play, dear. Hold your peace, I woe not. Why, love? Why, I'll tell you. Alethea, aside. Nay, if he tell her, she'll give him more cause to forbid her that place. Pray why, dear? First, you like the actors, and the gallants may like you. What? A homely country girl? No, bud, nobody will like me. I tell you, yes, they may. No, no, you jest. I won't believe you. I will go. I tell you, then, that one of the lewdest fellows in town who saw you there told me he was in love with you. Indeed. Who? Who, pray, who wast? Pinchwife, aside. I've gone too far and slipped before I was aware. How overjoyed she is. Was it any Hampshire gallant, any of our neighbours? Oh, I promise you I am beholden to him. I promise you, you lie, for he would but ruin you as he has done hundreds. He has no other love for women but that. Such as he look upon women like basilisks, but to destroy them. Ay, but if he loves me, why should he ruin me? Answer me to that. Methinks he should not. I would do him no harm. <laughs> Tis very well, but I'll keep him from doing you any harm, or me either. But here comes company. Get you in, get you in. But pray, husband, is he a pretty gentleman that loves me? In, baggage, in. Thrusts her in and shuts the door. 
Enter Sparkish and Harcourt. What all the lewd libertines of the town brought to my lodging by this easy coxcomb? Steph, I'll not suffer it. Here, Harcourt, do you approve my choice? To Alethea. Dear little rogue, I told you I'd bring you acquainted with all my friends, the wits, and... Harcourt salutes her. Ay, and they shall know her as well as you yourself will, I warrant you. This is one of those, my pretty rogue, that are to dance at your wedding to-morrow, and him you must bid welcome ever to what you and I have. Pinchwife aside. Monstrous! Harcourt, how dost thou like her, Faith? Nay, dear, do not look down. I should hate to have a wife of mine out of countenance at anything. Pinchwife aside. Wonderful! Tell me, I say, Harcourt, how dost thou like her? Thou hast stared upon her enough to resolve me. So infinitely well that I could wish I had a mistress too, that might differ from her in nothing but her love and engagement to you. Sir, Master Sparkish has often told me that his acquaintance were all wits and railiers, and now I find it. No, by the universe, madam, he does not rally now. You may believe him. I do assure you he is the honestest, worthiest, true-hearted gentleman. A man of such perfect honor, he would say nothing to a lady he does not mean. Pinchwife aside. Praising another man to his mistress. Sir, you are so beyond expectation obliging that... Nay, egad, I am sure you do admire her extremely. I see it in your eyes. He does admire you, madam. By the world, don't you? Yes, above the world, all the most glorious part of it, her whole sex. Until now I never thought I should have envied you, or any man about to marry. But you have the best excuse for marriage I ever knew. Nay, now, sir... I'm satisfied you are of the society of the wits and railiers, since you cannot spare your friend, even when he is but too civil to you. But the surest sign is, since you are an enemy to marriage, for that I hear you hate as much as business or bad wine. Truly, madam, I was never an enemy to marriage till now, because marriage was never an enemy to me before. But why, sir, is marriage an enemy to you now? Because it robs you of your friend here? For you look upon a friend married as one gone into a monastery that is dead to the world. Tis indeed because you marry him. I see, madam, you can guess my meaning. I do confess heartily and openly. I wish it were in my power to break the match. By heavens, I would. Poor Frank. Would you be so unkind to me? No, no, tis not because I would be unkind to you. Poor oh, Frank, no gad, tis only his kindness to me. Pinchwife aside. Great kindness to you indeed, insensible fop. Let a man make love to his wife, to his face. Come, dear Frank, for all my wife there that shall be. Thou shalt enjoy me sometimes, dear rogue. By my honour, we men of wit condole for our deceased brother in marriage as much as one dead in earnest. I think that was prettily said of me, huh, Harcourt? But come, Frank, be not melancholy for me. No, I assure you I am not melancholy for you. Prithee, Frank, dost think my wife that shall be there a fine person? I could gaze upon her till I became as blind as you are. How am I? How? Because you are a lover. And true lovers are blind, stock blind. True, true, but by the world she has wit, too, as well as beauty. Go, go with her into a corner, and try if she has wit. Talk to her anything. She's bashful before me. Indeed, if a woman wants wit in a corner, she has it nowhere. Alethea, aside to Sparkish. Sir, you dispose of me a little before your time. Nay, nay, madam, let me have an earnest of your obedience, or go, go, madam. Harcourt courts Alethea aside. 
How, sir? If you are not concerned for the honour of a wife, I am for that of a sister. He shall not debauch her. Be a panda to your own wife. Bring men to her. Let them make love before your face. Thrust them into a corner together. Then leave them in private. Is this your town wit and conduct? <laughs> a silly wise rogue would make one laugh more than a stark fool. <laughs> I shall burst. Nay, you shall not disturb him. I'll vex thee by the world. Struggles with Pinchwife to keep him from Harcourt and Alethea. The writings are drawn, sir. Settlement's made. Tis too late, sir, and past all revocation. Then so is my death. I would not be unjust to him. Then why to me so? I have no obligation to you. My love. I had his before. You never had it. He wants, you see, jealousy. The only infallible sign of it. Love proceeds from esteem. He cannot distrust my virtue. Besides, he loves me, or he would not marry me. Marrying you is no more a sign of his love than bribing your woman that he may marry you is a sign of his generosity. Marriage is rather a sign of interest than love, and he that marries a fortune covets a mistress, not loves her. But if you take marriage for a sign of love, take it from me, immediately. No, now you have put a scruple in my head. But in short, sir, to end our dispute, I must marry him. My reputation would suffer in the world else. Now, if you marry him, with your pardon, madam, your reputation suffers in the world, and you would be thought in necessity for a cloak. Nay, now you are rude, sir. Mr. Sparkish. Pray come hither. Your friend here is very troublesome and very loving. Harcourt, aside to Alethea. Hold, hold. Do you hear that? Why, do you think I'll seem to be jealous, like a country bumpkin? No, rather be a cuckold like a credulous sit. Madam, you would not have been so little generous as to have told him? Yes, since you could be so little generous as to wrong him. Wrong him? No man can do it. He's beneath an injury. A bubble? A coward? A senseless idiot? A wretch so contemptible to all the world but you that— Hold, oh, do not rail at him. For since he is like to be my husband, I am resolved to like him. Nay, I think I am obliged to tell him you are not his friend. Master Sparkish! Master Sparkish! What? What? To Harcourt. Now, dear rogue, has not she wit? Not as much as I thought and hoped she had. Mr. Sparkish, do you bring people to rail at you? Madam? How? Oh, no. But if he does rail at me, tis but in jest, I warrant. What we wits do for one another, and never take any notice of it. He spoke so scurrilously of you, I had no patience to hear him. Besides, he has been making love to me. Harcourt aside. True damned Tildale woman. Pshaw, to show his parts. We wits rail and make love often, but to show our parts? As we have no affections, so we have no malice, we... He said you were a wretch below an injury? Pshaw. Harcourt aside. Damned, senseless, impudent, virtuous jade. Well, since she won't let me have her, she'll do as good. She'll make me hate her. A, a common bubble? Pshaw! A coward? Pshaw, pshaw! A senseless, driveling idiot? How? Did he disparage my parts? Nay, then, my honour's concerned. I can't put up that, sir. By the world, brother, help me to kill him. Aside. I may draw now, since we have the odds of him. Tis a good occasion, too, before my mistress. Offers to draw. Hold, hold! What, what? Alethea, aside. I must not let them kill the gentleman neither, for his kindness to me. I am so far from hating him, that I wish my gallant had his person and understanding. Nay, if my honour... I'll be thy death. Hold, hold! Oh, indeed, to tell the truth, the gentleman said after all that what he spoke was but out of friendship to you. How? Oh, say, I am, I am a fool. That is, no wit. Out of friendship to me? Yes, to try whether I was concerned enough for you, and made love to me only to be satisfied of my virtue, for your sake. Harcourt aside. 
kind, however. Nay, if it were so, my dear rogue, I ask thee pardon. But why would not you tell me so, Faith? Because I did not think on it, Faith. Come, Horner does not come. Harcourt, let's be gone to the new play. Come, madam. I will not go. If you intend to leave me alone in a box and run into the pit, as you used to do. Pshaw! I'll leave Harcourt with you in the box to entertain you, and that's as good. If I sat in the box, I should be thought to no judge but of trimmings. Come away, Harcourt, lead her down. Exeunt Sparkish, Harcourt, and Alethea. Well, go thy ways for the flower of the true town fops, such as spend their estates before they come to him, and are cuckolds before they're married. But let me go look to my own freehold. How? Enter Lady Fidget, Mrs. Dainty Fidget, and Mrs. Squeamish. Your servant, sir, where is your lady? We are come to wait upon her to the new play. A new play? And my husband will wait upon you presently. Pinchwife aside. Damn your civility. Aloud. Madame, by no means. I will not see Sir Jasper here till I have waited upon him at home, nor shall my wife see you till she has waited upon your ladyship at your lodgings. Now we are here, sir. No, madam. Pray, let us see her. We will not stir till we see her. Pinchwife aside. A pox on you all. Goes to the door and returns. But she has locked the door and is gone abroad. No, you have locked the door and she's within. They told us below she was here. Pinchwife aside. Will nothing do? Aloud. Well, it must out then. To tell you the truth, ladies, which I was afraid to let you know before, lest it might endanger your lives, my wife has just now the smallpox come upon her. Do not be frightened, but pray be gone, ladies. You shall not stay here in danger of your lives. Pray get you gone, ladies. No, no, we have all had em. Alack, alack. Come, come, we must see how it goes with her. I understand the disease. Come. Pinchwife aside. Well, there is no being too hard for women at their own weapon. Lying. Therefore, I'll quit the field. Exit. Hmm. Here's an example of jealousy. Indeed, as the world goes, I wonder there are no more jealous since wives are so neglected. Pshaw! As the world goes, to what end should they be jealous? Pho! Tis a nasty world. That men of parts great acquaintance and quality should take up with and spend themselves and fortunes in keeping little playhouse creatures foe oh. nay that women of understanding great acquaintance and good quality should fall a keeping too of little creatures foe oh. why tis the men of quality's fault they never visit women of honour and reputation as they used to do and have not so much as common civility for ladies of our rank, but use us with the same indifferency and ill-breeding as if we were all married to them. She says true. Tis an arrant shame women of quality should be so slighted. Methinks birth, birth should go for something. I have known men admired, courted, and followed for their titles only. Ay, one would think men of honour should not love, no more than marry, out of their own rank fie fie upon them they are come to think cross-breeding for themselves best as well as for their dogs and horses they are dogs and horses for it one would think if not for love for vanity a little nay they do satisfy their vanity upon us sometimes and are kind to us in their report tell all the world they lie with us damned rascals that we should be only wronged by em to report a man has had a person when he has not had a person is the greatest wrong in the whole world that can be done to a person well tis an errant shame noble persons should be so wronged and neglected but still tis an arrant a shame for a noble person to neglect her own honour and defame her own noble person with little inconsiderable fellows Fo i suppose the crime against our honour is the same with a man of quality as with another how no sure the man of quality is likest one's husband and therefore the fault should be the less 
but then the pleasure should be less fie 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 for shame sister whither shall we ramble be continent in your discourse or i shall hate you besides an intrigue is so much the more notorious for the man's quality <laughs> tis true that nobody takes notice of a private man and therefore with him tis more secret and the crimes the less when tis not known you say true if faith i think you are in the right aunt tis not an injury to a husband till it be an injury to our honours so that a woman of honour loses no honour with a private person and to say truth mrs dainty fidget apart to mrs squeamish so the little fellow is grown a private person with her but still my dear dear honour enter sir jasper fidget horner and dorlant ay my dear dear of honour thou hast still so much honour in thy mouth horner aside that she has none elsewhere oh what do you mean to bring in these upon us foe these are as bad as wits foe let us leave the room stay stay faith to tell you the naked truth fie sir jasper do not use that word naked well well in short i have business at whitehall and cannot go to the play with you therefore would have you go with those two to a play no not with the other but with mr horner there can be no more scandal to go with him than with mr tattle or master limberham with that nasty fellow no no nay prithee dear hear me whispers to lady fidget ladies horner and dorland draw near mrs squeamish and mrs dainty fidget stand off do not approach us you heard with the wits you are obscenity all over oh, and i would as soon look upon a picture of adam and eve without fig leaves as any of you if i could help it uh, therefore keep off and do not make us sick what a devil are these <laughs> why these are pretenders to honour as critics to wit only by censuring others does every raw peevish out of humoured affected dull tea-drinking arithmetical fop sets up for a wit by railing at men of sense so these for honour by railing at the court and ladies of as great honour as quality come mr horner i must desire you to go with these ladies to the play sir i sir ay ay come sir i must beg your pardon sir and theirs i will not be seen in women's company in public again for the world <laughs> strange aversion no he's for women's company in private he poor man he <laughs> tis a greater shame amongst lewd fellows to be seen in virtuous women's company than for the women to be seen with them indeed madam the time was i only hated virtuous women but now i hate the other too i beg your pardon ladies you are very obliging sir because we would not be troubled with you in sober sadness he shall go nay if he will not i am ready to wait upon the ladies and i think i am the fitter man you sir no i thank you for that master horner is a privileged man among the virtuous ladies twill be a great while before you are so <laughs> he's my wife's gallant <laughs> no pray withdraw sir for as i take it the virtuous ladies have no business with you and i am sure he can have none with them tis strange a man can't come amongst virtuous women now but among the same terms as men are admitted into the great turk seraglio but heavens keep me from being an ombre player with them but where is pinch wife exit come come man what avoid the sweet society of womankind 
That sweet, soft, gentle, tame, noble creature woman made for man's companion? So is that soft, gentle, tame, and more noble creature a spaniel, and has all their tricks, can fawn, lie down, suffer beating, and fawn the more, barks at your friends when they come to see you, makes your bed hard, gives you fleas, and the mange sometimes, and all the difference is, the spaniel's the more faithful animal, and fawns but upon one master. <laughs> Oh, the rude beast. Insolent brute. Brute, stinking, mortified, rotten French weather, to dare. Hold, and please your ladyship. For shame, Master Horner, your mother was a woman. Aside. Now shall I never reconcile em. Aside to Lady Fidget. Hark you, madam, take my advice in your anger. You know you often want one to make up your drolling pack of ombre players, and you may cheat him easily, for he's an ill gamester, and consequently loves play. Besides, you know you have but two old civil gentlemen, with stinking breaths too, to wait upon you abroad. Take in the third into your service, the other but crazy, and a lady should have a supernumerary gentleman usher as a supernumerary coach horse, lest sometimes you should be forced to stay at home. But are you sure he loves play and has money? He loves play as much as you, and has money as much as I. Then I am contented to make him pay for his scurrility. Money makes up in a measure all other wants in men. Aside. Those whom we cannot make hold for gallants, we make fine. Sir Jasper aside. So, so. Now to mollify, wheedle him. Aside to Horner. Master Horner, will you never keep civil company? Methinks tis time now, since you are only fit for them. Come, come, man, you must e'en fall to visiting our wives, eating at our tables, drinking tea with our virtuous relations after dinner, dealing cards to em reading plays and gazettes to him, picking fleas out of their smocks for him, collecting receipts, new songs, women, pages, and footmen for him. I hope they'll afford me better employment, sir. <laughs> Tis fit you know your work before you come into your place, and since you are unprovided of a lady to flatter and a good house to eat at, pray frequent mine and call my wife mistress, and she shall call you gallant, according to the custom. Who? I? Faith, thou shalt for my sake come, for my sake only. For your sake? Come, come, here's a gamester for you. Let him be a little familiar sometimes. Nay, what if a little rude? Gamesters may be rude with ladies, you know. Yes, losing gamesters have a privilege with women. I always thought the contrary, that the winning gamester had most privilege with women, for when you have lost your money to a man, you lose anything you have, all you have, they say, and he may use you as he pleases. Hey, <laughs> well, win or lose, you shall have your liberty with her. As he behaves himself, and for your sake I'll give him admittance and freedom. All sorts of freedom, madam. Ay, 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 all sorts of freedom thou canst take. And so go to her, begin thy new employment, wheedle her, jest with her, and be better acquainted one with another. Horner aside. I think I know her already. Therefore may venture with her my secret for hers. Horner and Lady Fidget whisper. Sister Cuz, I have provided an innocent playfellow for you there. Who? He? Huh, there's a playfellow, indeed. Yes, sure. What, he is good enough to play at cards, blind man's bluff, or the fool with sometimes? A foe? We'll have no such playfellows. No, sir, you shan't choose playfellows for us. We thank you. Nay, pray hear me. Whispering to them. But... 
Poor gentleman, could you be so generous, so truly a man of honour, as for the sakes of us women of honour, to cause yourself to be reported no man? No man! And to suffer yourself the greatest shame that could fall upon a man, that none might fall upon us women by your conversation. But indeed, sir, as perfectly, perfectly the same man as before your going into France, sir, as perfectly, perfectly, sir? As perfectly, perfectly, madam. Nay, I scorn you should take my word. I desire to be tried only, madam. Well, that's spoken again like a man of honour. All men of honour desire to come to the test. But, indeed, generally you men report such things of yourselves, one does not know how or whom to believe. And it is come to that pass. We dare not take your words, no more than your tailors, without some staid servant of yours be bound with you. But I have so strong a faith in your honour, dear, dear noble sir, that I'd forfeit mine for yours at any time, dear sir. No, madam, you should not need to forfeit it for me. I have given you security already to save you harmless, my late reputation being so well known in the world, madam. But if upon any future falling out, or upon a suspicion of my taking the trust out of your hands to employ some other, you yourself should betray your trust, dear sir. I mean, if you'll give me leave to speak obscenely, you might tell, dear sir. If I did, nobody would believe me. The reputation of impotency is as hardly recovered again in the world as that of cowardice, dear madam. Nay, then, as one may say, you may do your worst, dear, dear sir. Come, is your ladyship reconciled to him yet? Have you agreed on matters? For I must be gone to Whitehall. Why, indeed, Sir Jasper, Master Horner is a thousand, thousand times a better man than I thought him. Cousin Squeamish, Sister Dainty, I can name him now. Truly, not long ago, you know, I thought his very name obscenity. And I would as soon have lain with him as have named him. Very likely, poor madam. I believe it. <laughs> no doubt on it. Well, well, that your ladyship is as virtuous as any she i know and him all the town knows <laughs> therefore now you like him get you gone to your business together go go to your business i say pleasure whilst i go to my pleasure business come then dear gallant come away my dearest mistress so so why tis as i'd have it exit and as i'd have it who for his business from his wife will run takes the best care to have her business done exeunt end of act two act three of the country wife by william witcherly scene one a room in pinchwife's house enter alethea and mrs pinchwife sister what ails you you are grown melancholy would it not make any one melancholy to see you go every day fluttering about abroad, while I must stay at home like a poor, lonely, sullen bird in a cage? Ay, sister, but you came young, and just from the nest to your cage, so that I thought you liked it, and could be as cheerful in it as others that took their flight themselves early, and are hopping abroad in the open air. Nay, I confess I was quiet enough till my husband told me what pure lives the London ladies live abroad, with their dancing, meetings, and junketings, and dressed every day in their best gowns, and, I warrant you, play at nine pins every day of the week, so they do. Enter Pinchwife. Come, what's here to do? You're putting the town pleasures in her head and setting her a longing. Yes, after nine pins. You suffer none to give her those longings you mean but yourself. Well, I tell her of the vanities of the town, like a confessor. A confessor? Just such a confessor as he that, by forbidding a silly ostler to grease the horse's teeth, taught him to do it. Come, Mrs. Flippant, good precepts are lost when bad examples are still before us. The liberty you take abroad makes her hanker after it, and out of humour at home. Poor wretch, she desired not to come to London. I would bring her. Very well. She has been this week in town, and never desired to this afternoon to go abroad. Was she not at a play yesterday? Yes, but she ne'er asked me. I was myself the cause of her going. Then, if she asks you again, you are the cause of her asking, and not my example. 
"'Well, to-morrow night I shall be rid of you, "'and the next day, before tis light, "'she and I'll be rid of the town, "'and my dreadful apprehensions. "'Come, be not melancholy, "'for thou shalt go into the country after to-morrow, dearest.' "'Great comfort. "'Pish, what do you tell me of the country for?' "'How's this? "'What? "'Pish at the country?' "'Let me alone. "'I am not well.' "'Oh, if that be all. "'What ails, my dearest?' "'Truly, I don't know. "'But I have not been well since you told me "'there was a gallant at the play in love with me.' "'Ha! "'That's by my example, too. "'Nay, if you are not well, but are so concerned "'because a lewd fellow chanced to lie and say he liked you, "'you'll make me sick, too.' "'Of what sickness?' "'Oh, of that which is worse than the plague. "'Jealousy!' "'Pish, you jeer. "'I'm sure there's no such disease in our receipt book at home.' "'No, thou never met'st with it, poor innocent.' "'Aside.' "'Well, if thou cuckold me, twill be my own fault, "'for cuckolds and bastards are generally makers of their own fortune.' "'Well, but pray, but let's go to a play tonight.' "'Tis just done. She comes from it. "'But why are you so eager to see a play?' "'Faith, dear, not that I care one pin for their talk there, "'but I like to look upon the player men "'and would see if I could the gallant you say loves me. "'That's all, dear Bud.' "'Oh, is that all, dear Bud?' "'This proceeds from my example.' "'But if the play be done, let's go abroad, however, dear Bud.' Come, have a little patience, and thou shalt go into the country on Friday. Therefore I would see first some sights to tell my neighbours of. Nay, I will go abroad, that's once. I'm the cause of this desire, too. But now I think, aunt, who, who was the cause of Horner's coming to my lodgings today? That was you. No, you, because you would not let him see your handsome wife out of your lodging. Why, oh, Lord, did the gentleman come hither to see me indeed? No, no, you were not the cause of that damned question too, Mistress Alethea. Aside. Well, she's in the right of it. He is in love with my wife, and comes after her, tis so. But I'll nip his love in the bud, lest he should follow us into the country and break his chariot wheel near our house, on purpose for an excuse to come to it. "'But I think I know the town.' "'Come, pray, bud, let's go abroad before tis late, "'for I will go that's flat and plain.' "'Pinchwife, aside.' "'So, the obstinacy already of the town wife, "'and I must, while she's here, humour her like one.' "'Aloud.' "'Sister, how shall we do that she may not be seen or known?' "'Let her put on her mask.' Pshaw! A mask makes people but the more inquisitive, and is as ridiculous a disguise as a stage beard. Her shape, stature, habit will be known, and if we should meet with Horner, he would be sure to take acquaintance with us. We must wish her joy, kiss her, talk to her, leer upon her, and the devil and all. No, I'll not use her to a mask. Tis dangerous, for masks have made more cuckolds than the best faces that were ever known. How will you do then? Nay, shall we go? The exchange will be shut, and I have a mind to see that. So I have it. I'll dress her up in the suit we were to carry down to her brother, little Sir James. Nay, I understand the town tricks. Come, let's go dress her. A mask, no. A woman mask like a covered dish gives a man curiosity and appetite, when it may be uncovered to turn his stomach. No, no. Indeed, your comparison is something a greasy one. But I had a gentle gallant used to say, a beauty mast, like the sun in eclipse, gathers together more gazes than if it shined out. Exeunt. Scene two. The new exchange. Enter Horner, Harcourt, and Dorland. Engage to women and not sup with us. Aye, a pox on him all. You were a much more reasonable man in the morning and had as noble resolutions against him as a widower of a week's liberty. Did I ever think to see you keep company with women in vain? In vain? <laughs> no, tis since I can't love him not to be revenged on him. Now your sting is gone. You looked in the box amongst all those women like a drone in the hive. All upon you, shoved and ill-used by them all, 
and thrust from one side to the other. Yet he must be buzzing amongst them still, like other beetle-headed licorice drones. Avoid him and hate him as they hate you. Because I do hate him, and would hate him yet more, I'll frequent him. You may see by marriage, nothing makes a man hate a woman more than her constant conversation. In short, I converse with him, as you do with rich fools, to laugh at him and use him ill. But I would no more sup with women unless I could lie with them, than sup with a rich coxcomb unless I could cheat him. Yes, I have known thee sup with a fool for his drinking. If he could set out your hand that way only, you were satisfied, and if he were a wine-swallowing mouth, twas enough. Yes, a man drinks often with a fool as he tosses with a marker, only to keep his hand in use. But do the ladies drink? Yes, sir, and I shall have the pleasure at least of laying him flat with a bottle, and bring as much scandal that way upon him as formerly t'other. Perhaps you may prove as weak a brother among em that way as t'other. Foe, drinking with women is as unnatural as scolding with them. But tis a pleasure of decaying fornicators, and the basest way of quenching love. Nay, tis drowning love, instead of quenching it. But leave us for civil women, too. Ay, when he can't be the better for em. We hardly pardon a man that leaves his friend for a wench, and that's a pretty lawful call. Faith, I would not leave you for him if they would not drink. Who would disappoint his company at Lewis's for a gossiping? Fair. Wine and women, good apart, together are as nauseous as suck and sugar. But hark you, sir, before you go, a little of your advice. An old maimed general, when unfit for action, is fittest for counsel. I have other designs upon women than eating and drinking with them. I am in love with Sparkish's mistress, whom he is to marry tomorrow. Now, how shall I get her? Enter Sparkish, looking about. Why, here comes one will help you to her. He? He, I tell you, is my rival and will hinder my love. No, a foolish rival and a jealous husband assist their rival's designs, for they are sure to make their women hate them, which is the first step to their love for another man. But I cannot come near his mistress but in his company. Still the better for you, for fools are most easily cheated when they themselves are accessories, and he is to be bubbled of his mistress as of his money, the common mistress, by keeping him company. Who is that that is to be bubbled? Faith, let me snack. I haven't met with a bubble since Christmas. Gad, I think bubbles are like their brother Woodcocks. Go out and with the cold weather. Harcourt apart to Horner. A pox! He did not hear all, I hope. Come, you bubbling rogues, you. Where do we sup? Oh, Harcourt, my mistress tells me you have been making fierce love to her all the play long. <laughs> But I... I make love to her? Nay, I forgive thee, for I think I know thee, and I know her. But I am sure I know myself. Did she tell you so? I see all women are like these of the exchange, who to enhance the prize of their commodities, report to their fond customers offers which were never made em. I... Women are apt to tell before the intrigue, as men after it, and so show themselves the vainer sex. But hast thou a mistress, Sparkish? Tis as hard for me to believe it, as that thou ever hadst a bubble, as you bragged just now. Oh, your servant, sir. Are you at your raillery, sir? But we are some of us beforehand with you to-day at the play. The wits were something bold with you, sir. Did you not hear us laugh? Yes, but I thought you had gone to plays, to laugh at the poet's wit, not at your own. Your servant, sir? No, I thank you. Gad, I go to a play as to a country treat. I carry my own wine to one, and my own wit to the other, or else I'm sure I should not be merry at either. And the reason why we are so often louder than the players is because we think we speak more wit and so become the poet's rivals in his audience. 
for to tell you the truth, we hate the silly rogues. Nay, so much that we find fault even with their body upon the stage, whilst we talk nothing else in the pit as loud. But why shouldst thou hate the silly poets? Thou hast too much wit to be one, and they, like whores, are only hated by each other, and thou dost scorn writing, I'm sure. Yes, I'd have you to know I scorn writing. But women, women, that make men do all foolish things, make em write songs, too. Everybody does it. Tis even as common with lovers as playing with fans. And you can no more help rhyming to your Phyllis than drinking to your Phyllis. Nay, poetry and love is no more to be avoided than jealousy. But the poets damned your songs, did they? Damn the poets. They have turned them into burlesque, as they call it. That burlesque is a hocus-pocus trick they have got, which, by the virtue of Hictius Doctius Topsy-Turvy, they make a wise and witty man in the world, a fool upon the stage you know not how. And tis therefore I hate him too, for I know not, but it may be my own case. For they'll put a man into a play for looking a squint. Their predecessors were contented to make serving men only their stage fools. But these rogues must have gentlemen, with a pox to em, nay, knights. And indeed, you shall hardly see a fool upon the stage, but he's a knight. And to tell you the truth, they have kept me these six years from being a knight in earnest, for fear of being knighted in a play, and dubbed a fool. Blame em not, they must follow their copy. The age. But why shouldst thou be afraid of being in a play who expose yourself every day in the playhouses and at public places? Tis but being on the stage, instead of standing on a bench in the pit. Don't you give money to painters to draw you like? And are you afraid of your pictures at length in a playhouse where all your mistresses may see you? A oh, pox. Painters don't draw the smallpox or pimples on one's face. Come. Damn all your silly authors, whatever, all books and booksellers by the world, and all readers, courteous or uncourteous. But who comes here, Sparkish? Enter Pinchwife and Mrs. Pinchwife in man's clothes, Alethea and Lucy. Oh, hide me. There's my mistress, too. Sparkish hides himself behind Harcourt. She sees you. But I will not see her. Tis time to go to Whitehall and I must not fail the drawing-room. Pray first carry me and reconcile me to her. Another time. Faith, the king will have supped. Not with the worst stomach for thy absence? Thou art one of those fools that think their attendance at the king's mills as necessary as his physicians, when you are more troublesome to him than his doctors or his dogs. Pshaw, I know my interest, sir. Prithee, hide me. Your servant, Pinchwife. What? He knows us not. Pinchwife to his wife aside. Come along. Pray, have you any ballads? Give me six pennyworth. We have no ballads. Then give me Covent Garden drollery and a play or two. Oh, here's Tarugo's Wilds and The Slighted Maiden. I'll have them. Pinchwife, apart to her. No, plays are not for your reading. Come along. Will you discover yourself? Who is that pretty youth with him, Sparkish? I believe his wife's brother, because he's something like her. But I never saw her but once. Extremely handsome. I have seen a face like it too. Uh, let us follow him. Exeunt Pinchwife, Mrs. Pinchwife, Alethea, and Lucy, Horner and Dorlant following them. Come, Sparkish, your mistress saw you, and will be angry you go not to her. Besides, I would fain be reconciled to her, which none but you can do, dear friend. Well, that's a better reason, dear friend. I would not go near her now, for hers or my own sake, but I can deny you nothing. For though I have known thee a great while, never go, if I do not love thee as well as a new acquaintance. I am obliged to you indeed, dear friend. I would be well with her, only to be well with thee still, 
for these ties to wives usually dissolve all ties to friends i would be contented she should enjoy you a nights but i would have you to myself a days as i have had dear friend and thou shalt enjoy me a days dear dear friend never stir and i'll be divorced from her sooner than from thee come along harcourt aside so we are hard put to it when we make our rival our procurer but neither she nor her brother would let me come near her now when all's done a rival is the best cloak to steal to a mistress under without suspicion and when we have once got to her as we desire we throw him off like other cloaks exit sparkish harcourt following him re-enter pinchwife and mrs pinchwife pinchwife to alethea sister if you will not go we must leave you aside the fool her gallant and she will muster up all the young saunterers of this place and they will leave their dear sempstresses to follow us what a swarm of cuckolds and cuckold makers are here come let's be gone mistress marjorie don't you believe that i ha'n't half my belly full of sights yet then walk this way lord what a power of brave signs are here stay the bull's head the ram's head and the stag's head dear nay if every husband's proper sign were visible they would be all alike what do you mean by that bud tis no matter no matter bud pray tell me nay i will know they would all be bulls stags and ram heads exeunt pinchwife and mrs pinchwife re-enter sparkish harcourt alethea and lucy at the other side come dear madam for my sake you shall be reconciled to him for your sake i hate him that's something too cruel madam to hate me for his sake ay indeed madam too too cruel to me to hate my friend for my sake i hate him because he is your enemy and you ought to hate him too for making love to me if you love me that's a good one i hate a man for loving you if he did love you tis but what he can't help and tis your fault not his if he admires you i hate a man for being of my opinion i'll never do it by the world is it for your honour or mine to suffer a man to make love to me who am to marry you to-morrow is it for your honour or mine to have me jealous that he makes love to you is a sign you are handsome and that i am not jealous is a sign you are virtuous that i think is for your honour but tis your honour too i am concerned for but why dearest madam will you be more concerned for his honour than he is himself let his honour alone for my sake and his he he has no honour how's that but what my dear friend can guard himself oh that's right again your care of his honour argues his neglect of it which is no honour to my dear friend here therefore once more let his honour go which way it will dear madam ay ay were it for my honour to marry a woman whose virtue i suspected and could not trust her in a friend's hands are you not afraid to lose me he afraid to lose you madam no no you may see how the most estimable and most glorious creature in the world is valued by him will you not see it right honest frank i have that noble value for her that i cannot be jealous of her you mistake him he means you care not for me nor who has me lord madam i see you are jealous will you wrest a poor man's meaning from his words you astonish me sir with your want of jealousy and you make me giddy madam with your jealousy and fears and virtue and honour gad i see virtue makes a woman as troublesome as a little reading or learning monstrous lucy aside well to see what easy husbands these women of quality can meet with <laughs> a poor chambermaid can never have such ladylike luck besides he's thrown away upon her she'll make no use of her fortune her blessing none to a gentleman for a pure cuckold for it requires good breeding to be a cuckold i tell you then plainly 
He pursues me to marry me. Pshaw! Sure. Come, madam, you see you strive in vain to make him jealous of me. My dear friend is the kindest creature in the world to me. Poor fellow! But his kindness only is not enough for me. Without your favour, your good opinion, dear madam, tis that must perfect my happiness. Good gentleman, he believes all I say. Would you would do so? Jealous of me? I would not wrong him nor you for the world. Look you there. Hear him, hear him, and do not walk away so. Alethea walks carelessly to and fro. I love you, madam, so. How's that? Nay, now you begin to go too far indeed. So much, I confess, I say I love you, that I would not have you miserable and cast yourself away upon so unworthy and inconsiderable a thing as what you see here. Harcourt, clapping his hand on his breast, points at Sparkish. No, faith. I believe thou wouldst not. Now his meaning is plain, but I knew before thou wouldst not wrong me, nor her. No, no, heavens forbid the glory of her sex should fall so low, as into the embraces of such a contemptible wretch, the least of mankind, my friend here, I injure him. Embracing Sparkish. Very well. No, no, dear friend, I knew it. Madam, you see, he will rather wrong himself than me in giving himself such names. Do you not understand him yet? Yes. How modestly he speaks of himself, poor fellow. Methinks he speaks impudently of yourself, since, before yourself too, insomuch that I can no longer suffer his scurrilous abusiveness to you, no more than his love to me. Offers to go. Nay, nay, madam. Pray stay, his love to you. Lord, madam, has he not spoke yet plain enough? Yes, indeed, I should think so. Well, then, by the world, a man can't speak civilly to a woman now, but presently, she says, he makes love to her. Nay, madam, you shall stay, with your pardon, since you have not yet understood him, till he has made an eclaircissement of his love to you. That is, what kind of love it is. Answer thy catechism, friend. Do you love my mistress here? Yes, I wish she would not doubt it. But how do you love her? With all my soul. I thank him. Methinks he speaks plain enough now. Sparkish to Alethea. You are out still. But with what kind of love, Harcourt? With the best and the truest love in the world. Look you there, then. That is, with no matrimonial love, I'm sure. How's that? Do you say matrimonial love is not best? Yet yeah, I went too far ere I was aware. But speak for thyself, Harcourt. You said you would not wrong me nor her. No, so, madam, even take him, for heaven's sake. Look you there, madam. Who should in all justice be yours? He that loves you most. Claps his hand on his breast. Look you there, Mr. Sparkish. Who's that? Who should it be? Go on, Harcourt. Who loves you more than women titles or fortune fools? Points at Sparkish. Oh, look you there. He means me still, for he points at me. Ridiculous. Who can only match your faith and constancy in love? I. Who knows if it be possible how to value so much beauty and virtue? I. Whose love can no more be equalled in the world than that heavenly form of yours? No. Who could no more suffer a rival than your absence, and yet could no more suspect your virtue than his own constancy in his love to you? No. Who, in fine, loves you better than his eyes that first made him love you? I, Nay, madam, faith, you shan't go till... Have a care, lest you make me stay too long. But till he has saluted you, that I may be assured you are friends, after his honest advice and declaration. Come, pray, madam, be friends with him. 
re-enter pinchwife and mrs pinchwife you must pardon me sir that i am not yet so obedient to you what invite your wife to kiss men monstrous are you not ashamed i will never forgive you are you not ashamed that i should have more confidence in the chastity of your family than you have you must not teach me i am a man of honour sir though i am frank and free i am frank sir very frank sir to share your wife with your friends he is an humble menial friend such as reconciles the differences of the marriage bed you know man and wife do not always agree i design him for that use therefore would have him well with my wife a menial friend you will get a great many menial friends by showing your wife as you do what then it may be i have a pleasure in it as i have to show fine clothes at a playhouse the first day and count money before poor rogues he that shows his wife all money will be in danger of having them borrowed sometimes i love to be envied and would not marry a wife that i alone could love loving alone is dull as eating alone is it not a frank age and i am a frank person and to tell you the truth it may be i love to have rivals in a wife they make her seem to a man still but as a kept mistress and so good night for i must to whitehall madam i hope you are now reconciled to my friend and so i wish you a good night madam and sleep if you can for to-morrow you know i must visit you early with a canonical gentleman good night dear harcourt exit madam i hope you will not refuse my visit to-morrow if it should be earlier with a canonical gentleman than mr sparkish's this gentlewoman is yet under my care therefore you must yet forbear your freedom with her sir coming between alethea and harcourt must sir yes sir she is my sister tis well she is sir for i must be her servant sir madam come away sister we had been gone if it had not been for you and so avoided these lewd rakehells who seem to haunt us re-enter horner and dorland how now pinchwife your servant what i see a little time in the country makes a man turn wild and unsociable and only fit to converse with his horses dogs and his herds i have business sir and must mind it your business is pleasure therefore you and i must go different ways well you may go on but this pretty young gentleman takes hold of mrs pinchwife the lady and the maid shall stay with us for i suppose their business is the same with ours pleasure pinchwife aside steph he knows her she carries it so sillily yet if he does not i should be more silly to discover it first pray let us go sir come come horner to mrs pinchwife had you not rather stay with us prithee pinchwife who is this pretty young gentleman one to whom i'm guardian aside i wish i could keep her out of your hands who is he i never saw anything so pretty in all my life uh, pshaw do not look upon him so much he's a poor bashful youth you'll put him out of countenance come away brother offers to take her away oh your brother yes my wife's brother come come she'll stay supper for us i thought so for he is very like her i saw you at the play with whom i told you i was in love with mrs pinchwife aside oh gemini is that he that was in love with me i'm glad on tai wow for he's a curious fine gentleman and i love him already too to pinchwife is this he but pinchwife to his wife come away come away why what haste are you in why won't you let me talk with him because you'll debauch him he's yet young and innocent and i would not have him debauched for anything in the world aside how she gazes on him the devil harcourt dorland look you here this is the likeness of that dowd he told us of his wife did you ever see a lovelier creature 
The rogue has reason to be jealous of his wife, since she's like him, or she would make all that see her in love with her. And, as I remember now, she is as like him here as can be. She is indeed very pretty if she be like him. Very pretty? Ha! <laughs> a very pretty commendation. She is a glorious creature, beautiful beyond all things I ever beheld. So, so. More beautiful than a poet's first mistress of imagination. Or another man's last mistress of flesh and blood. Nay, now you jeer, sir. Pray don't jeer me. Come, come. Aside. By heavens she'll discover herself. <sighs> I speak of your sister, sir. Ay, but saying she was handsome, if like him, made him blush. Aside. I am upon a rack. Methinks he is so handsome, he should not be a man. Pinchwife aside. Oh, there, tis out. He has discovered her. I am not able to suffer any longer. To his wife. Come, come away, I say. Nay, by your leave, sir, he shall not go yet. Aside to them. Harcourt, Dorland, let us torment this jealous rogue a little. How? I'll show you. Come, pray, let him go. I cannot stay fooling any longer. I tell you his sister stays supper for us. Does she? Come, then, we'll all go to sup with he and thee. No, uh, now I think, aunt, having stayed so long for us, I warrant she's gone to bed. Aside. I wish she and I were well out of their hands. To his wife. Come, I must rise early tomorrow. Come. Well, then, if she be gone to bed, I wish her and you a good night. But pray, young gentleman, present my humble service to her. Thank you heartily, sir. Pinchwife aside. Steph, she will discover herself yet in spite of me. Aloud. He is something more civil to you for your kindness to his sister than I am, it seems. Tell her, dear sweet little gentleman, for all your brother there, that you have revived the love I had for her at first sight in the playhouse. But did you love her indeed, and indeed? Pinchwife aside. So, so. Aloud. Away, I say. Nay, stay. Yes, indeed, and indeed. Pray do you tell her so, and give her this kiss from me. Pinchwife aside. Oh, heavens, what do I suffer? Now tis too plain he knows her, and yet... And this, and this... What do you kiss me for? I am no woman. Pinchwife aside. So there, tis out. Aloud. Come, I cannot, nor will, stay any longer. Nay, they shall send your lady a kiss too. Here, Harcourt, Dorland, will you not? Pinchwife aside. How do I suffer this? Was I not accusing another just now for his rascally patience in permitting his wife to be kissed before his face? Ten thousand ulcers gnaw away their lips. Aloud. Come, come. Good night, dear little gentleman. Madam, good night. Farewell, Pinchwife. Apart to Harcourt and Doralant. Did not I tell you I was raised as jealous gall? Exeunt Horner, Harcourt, and Dorlant. So, they are gone at last. Stay, let me see first if the coach be at this door. Exit. Re-enter Horner, Harcourt, and Dorlant. What? Not gone yet? Will you be sure to do as I desired you, sweet sir? Sweet sir? But what will you give me then? Anything. Come away into the next walk. Exit, hailing away Mrs. Pinchwife. Hold, hold! What do you do? Stay, stay, hold! Hold, madam, hold! Let him present him! He'll come presently! Nay, I will never let you go till you answer my question. For God's sake, sir, I must follow him. Alethea and Lucy struggling with Harcourt and Dorlant. No, I have something to present you with, too. You shan't follow them. Re-enter Pinchwife. Where? How? What's become of... Gone? Whither? He's only gone with the gentleman. Who will give him something, and it please your worship? Something? Give him something with a pox? 
Where are they? In the next walk only, brother. Only? Only? Where? Where? Exit and returns presently, then goes out again. What's the matter with him? Why so much concerned? But, dearest madam... Pray let me go, sir. I have said and suffered enough already. Then you will not look upon nor pity my sufferings? To look upon him when I cannot help him were cruelty, not pity. Therefore, I will never see you more. Let me then, madam, have my privilege of a banished lover, complaining or railing, and give you but a farewell reason why, if you cannot condescend to marry me, you should not take that wretch, my rival. He only, not you, since my honour is engaged so far to him, can give me a reason why I should not marry him. But if he be true, and what I think him to me, I must be so to him. Your servant, sir. Have women only constancy when tis a vice, and are like fortune only true to fools? Dorland, to Lucy, who struggles to get from him. Thou shalt not stir, thou robust creature. You see, I can deal with you, therefore you should stay the rather, and be kind. Re-enter Pinchwife. Gone, gone, not to be found, quite gone. Ten thousand plagues go with them. Which way went they? But into t'other walk, brother. Their business will be done presently, sure, and it please your worship. It can't be long in doing, I'm sure on it. Are they not there? No, you know where they are, you infamous wretch, eternal shame of your family, which you do not dishonour enough yourself, you think, but you must help her to do it too, thou legion of bods. Good brother. Damned, damned sister. Oh, look you here, she's coming. Re-enter Mrs. Pinchwife running with her hat full of oranges and dried fruit under her arm, Horner following. Oh, dear bod, look you here what I've got. See? Pinchwife. Aside, rubbing his forehead. And what have I got here, too, which you can't see? The fine gentleman has given me better things yet. Has he so? Aside. Out of breath and coloured, I must hold yet. I have only given your little brother an orange, sir. Pinchwife to Horner. Thank you, sir. Aside. You have only squeezed my orange, I suppose, and given it me again. Yet I must have a city patience. To his wife. Come. Come away. Stay till I have put up my fine things, bud. Enter Sir Jasper Fidget. Oh, Master Horner, come, come. The lady stay for you. Your mistress, my wife, wonders you make not more haste to her. I have stayed this half hour for you here, and tis your fault I am not now with your wife. But pray, don't let her know so much. The truth, aunt, is, I was advancing a certain project to his majesty about. I'll tell you. No, let's go, and hear it at your house. Good night, sweet little gentleman. One kiss more. You'll remember me now, I hope. What, Sir Jasper? You will separate friends? He promised to sup with us, and if you take him to your house, you'll be in danger of our company too. Alas, gentlemen, my house is not fit for you. There are none but civil women there, which are not for your turn. He, you know, can bear with the society of civil women now. <laughs> Besides, he's one of my family. He's... <laughs> what is he? Faith. My eunuch, since you'd have it. <laughs> Exeunt Sir Jasper Fidget and Horner. I rather wish thou wert his or my cuckold. Harcourt, what a good cuckold is thus there for want of a man to make him one. Thee and I cannot have Horner's privilege, who can make use of it. I to poor Horner, tis like coming to an estate at threescore, when a man can't be the better for it. Come. Presently, bud. Come, let us go to... To Alethea. Madam, your servant. To Lucy. Good night, Strapper. Madam, though you will not let me have a good day or night, I wish you one, but dare not name the other half of my wish. Good night, sir. Forever. 
I don't know where to put this here, dear bud. You shall eat it. Nay, you shall have part of the fine gentleman's good things, or treat, as you call it, when we come home. Indeed, I deserve it, since I furnished the best part of it. Strikes away the orange. The gallant treats presents and gives the ball, but as the absent cuckold pays for all. Exeunt. End of Act 3. Act 4 of The Country Wife by William Witcherly. Scene 1. Pinchwife's house in the morning. Enter Alethea dressed in new clothes and Lucy. Well, madam, now I have dressed you and set you out with so many ornaments and spent upon you ounces of essence and povilio, and all this for no other purpose but as people adorn and perfume a corpse for a stinking second-hand grave. Such, or as bad, I think, Master Sparkish's bed. Hold your peace. Nay, madam, I will ask you the reason why you had banished poor Master Harcourt for ever from your sight. How could you be so hard-hearted? T'was because I was not hard-hearted. No, no, t'was stark love and kindness, I warrant. It was so. I would see him no more, because I love him. Hey, day, <laughs> A very pretty reason. You do not understand me. I wish you may yourself. I was engaged to marry, you see, another man, whom my justice will not suffer me to deceive or injure. Can there be a greater cheat or wrong done to a man than to give him your person without your heart? I should make a conscience of it. I'll retrieve it for him after I am married a while. <laughs> the woman that marries to love better will be as much mistaken as the wencher that marries to live better. No, madam. Marrying to increase love is like gaming to become rich. Alas, you only lose what little stock you had before. I find by your rhetoric you have been bribed to betray me. Only by his merit that has bribed your heart, you see, against your word and rigid honour. But what a devil is this honour? Tis sure a disease in the head, like the megram or falling sickness that always hurries people away to do themselves mischief. Men lose their lives by it. Women, what's dearer to them? Their love. The life of life. Oh, come. Pray talk you know more of honour nor Master Harcourt. I wish the other would come to secure my fidelity to him and his right in me. You will marry him, then? Certainly. I have given him already my word, and well my hand, too, to make it good when he comes. Well, I wish I may never stick pin more, if he be not an errant natural to the other fine gentleman. I own he wants the wit of Harcourt, which I will dispense with all for another want he has, which is want of jealousy which men of wit seldom want. Lord, madam, what should you do with a fool to your husband? You intend to be honest, don't you? Then that husbandly virtue, credulity, is thrown away upon you. He only that could suspect my virtue should have cause to do it. To sparkish his confidence in my truth that obliges me to be so faithful to him. You are not sure his opinion may last. I am satisfied. It is impossible for him to be jealous after the proofs I have had of him. Jealousy in a husband? Oh, heaven defend me from it. It begets a thousand plagues to her poor women. The loss of her honour, her quiet, and her... And her pleasure. What do you mean, impertinent? Liberty is a great pleasure, madam. I say, loss of her honour, her quiet, nay, her life sometimes. And what's as bad, almost, the loss of this town... That is, she is sent into the country, which is the last ill usage of a husband to a wife, I think. Lucy, aside. Oh, does the wind lie there? Aloud. Then, of necessity, madam, you think a man must carry his wife into the country if he be wise? The country is as terrible, I find, to our young English ladies as the monastery to those abroad. And on my virginity, I think they would rather marry a London jailer than a high sheriff of a county, since neither can stir from his employment. Formerly, women of wit married fools for a great estate, a fine seat, or, or the like. But now, tis for a pretty seat only in Lincoln's Inn Fields, St. James Fields, or the Pall Mall. 
Enter Sparkish and Harcourt, dressed like a parson. Madam, your humble servant, a happy day to you and to us all. Amen. Who have we here? My chaplain, Faith. Oh, madam, poor Harcourt remembers his humble service to you, and, in obedience to your last commands, refrains coming into your sight. Is not that he? No, fie, no. But to show that he never intended to hinder our match has sent his brother here to join our hands. When I get me a wife, I must get her a chaplain, according to the custom. That is his brother, and my chaplain. His brother? Lucy aside. And your chaplain to preach in your pulpit, then? His brother? Nay, I knew you would not believe it. I told you, sir, she would take you for your brother Frank. Believe it? Lucy aside. His brother? <laughs> he has a trick left still, it seems. Come, my dearest. Pray let us go to church before the canonical hour is past. For shame, you are abused still. By the world. Tis strange now you are so incredulous. Tis strange you are so credulous. Dearest of my life, hear me. I tell you this is Ned Harcourt of Cambridge by the world. You see he has a sneaking college look. Tis true he's something like his brother Frank and they differ from each other no more than in their age, for they were twins. <laughs> Your servant, sir, I cannot be so deceived, though you are. But come, that's here. How do you know what you affirm so confidently? Why, I'll tell you all. Frank Harcourt, coming to me this morning to wish me joy and present his service to me, I asked him if he could help me to a parson. Whereupon he told me, he had a brother in town who was in orders, and he went straight away and sent him, you see there, to me. Yes, Frank goes and puts on a black coat, then tells you he is Ned. That's all you have for it. Pshaw, pshaw. I tell you, by the same token, the midwife put her garter around Frank's neck to know them asunder. They were so like. Frank tells you this too? Aye, and Ned there too. Nay, they are both in a story. So, so. Very foolish. Lord, if you don't believe one, you had best try him by your chambermaid there, for chambermaids must needs know chaplains from other men. They are so used to them. <laughs> Let's see. Nay, I'll be sworn he has the canonical smirk and the filthy clammy palm of a chaplain. Well, most reverend doctor... Pray let us make an end of this fooling. With all my soul, divine heavenly creature, when you please. He speaks like a chaplain indeed. Why, was there not soul, divine, heavenly, in what he said? Once more, most impertinent black coat, cease your persecution, and let us have a conclusion of this ridiculous love. Harcourt aside. I had forgot. I must suit my style to my coat or I wear it in vain. I have no more patience left. Let us make once an end of this troublesome love, I say. So be it, seraphic lady, when your honour shall think it meet and convenient so to do. Gad, I'm sure none but a chaplain could speak so, I think. Let me tell you, sir, this dull trick will not serve your turn. Though you delay our marriage, you shall not hinder it. Far be it from me, munificent patroness to delay your marriage i desire nothing more than to marry you presently which i might do if you yourself would for my noble good-natured and thrice generous patron here would not hinder it no poor man not i faith and now madam let me tell you plainly nobody else shall marry you by heavens I'll die first, for I'm sure I shall die after it. <laughs> How his love has made him forget his function, as I have seen it in real persons. <laughs> that was spoken like a chaplain, too. Now you understand him, I hope. Poor man, he takes it heinously to be refused. I can't blame him, just putting an indignity upon him not to be suffered. But you'll pardon me, madam, it shan't be. 
he shall marry us come away pray madam <laughs> more ado tis late invincible stupidity i tell you he would marry me as your rival not as your chaplain come come madam pulling her away i pray madam do not refuse this reverend divine the honour and satisfaction of marrying you for i dare say he has set his heart upon it good doctor what can you hope or design by this harcourt aside i could answer her a reprieve for a day only often revokes a hasty doom at worst if she will not take mercy on me and let me marry her i have at least the lover's second pleasure hindering my rival's enjoyment though but for a time come madam tis e'en twelve o'clock and my mother charged me never to be married out of the canonical hours come come lord here's such a deal of modesty i warrant the first day yes and it please your worship married women show all their modesty the first day because married men show all their love the first day exeunt scene two a bedchamber in pinchwife's house pinchwife and mrs pinchwife discovered come tell me i say lord han't i told it a hundred times over pinchwife aside i would try if in the repetition of the ungrateful tale i could find her altering it in the least circumstance for if her story be false she is so too aloud come how wast baggage lord what pleasure you take to hear it sure no uh, you take more in telling it i find but speak how wast he carried me up into the house next to the exchange so and you two were only in the room yes for he sent away a youth that was there for some dried fruit and china oranges did he so damn him for it and for but presently came up the gentlewoman of the house oh twas well she did but what did he do whilst the fruit came he kissed me a hundred times and told me he fancied he kissed my fine sister meaning me you know whom he said he loved with all his soul and bid me be sure to tell her so and to desire her to be at her window by eleven o'clock this morning and he would walk under it at that time pinchwife aside hmm. and he was as good as his word very punctual a pox reward him fought well and he said if you were not within he would come up to her meaning me you know but still pinchwife aside so he knew her certainly but for this confession i am obliged to her simplicity aloud but what you stood very still when he kissed you yes i warrant you would you have had me discovered myself ah, but you told me he did some beastliness to you as you call it what was it why he put what why he put the tip of his tongue between my lips and so mousled me and i said i'd bite it an eternal canker seize it for a dog nay you need not be so angry with him neither for to say truth he has the sweetest breath i ever knew the devil you were satisfied with it then you would do it again not unless he should force me force you changeling i tell you no woman can be forced yes but she may sure by such as one as he for he's a proper goodly strong man tis hard let me tell you to resist him pinchwife aside so tis plain she loves him yet she has not love enough to make her conceal it from me but the sight of him will increase her aversion for me and love for him and that love instruct her how to deceive me and satisfy him all idiot as she is love twas he gave women first their craft their art of deluding out of nature's hands they came plain open silly and fit for slaves as she and heaven intended em but damned love well i must strangle that little monster whilst i can deal with him Aloud go fetch pen ink and paper out of the next room yes bud exit 
why should women have more invention in love than men it can only be because they have more desires more soliciting passions more lust and more of the devil re-enter mrs pinchwife come minx sit down and write i dear bud but i can't do it very well i wish you could not at all but what should i write for i'll have you write a letter to your lover oh lord to the fine gentleman a letter yes to the fine gentleman lord you do but jeer sure you jest i am not so merry come write as i bid you what do you think i am a fool pinchwife aside she's afraid i would not dictate any love to him therefore she's unwilling aloud but you had best begin indeed and indeed but i won't so i won't why because he's in town you may send for him if you will very well you would have him brought to you is it come to this i say take the pen and write or you'll provoke me lord what do you make a fool of me for don't i know that letters are never writ but from the country to london and from london into the country now he's in town and i'm in town too therefore i can't write to him you know pinchwife aside so i'm glad it is no worse she is innocent enough yet aloud yes you may when your husband bids you write letters to people that are in town oh may i so then i'm satisfied come begin dictates sir shan't i say dear sir you know one says always something more than bear sir write as i bid you or i'll write whore with this penknife in your face nay good bud writes sir though i suffered last night your nauseous loathed kisses and embraces write nay why should i say so you know i told you he had a sweet breath write let me but put out loathed right i say well then writes let's see what you have writ takes the paper and reads though i suffered last night your kisses and embraces thou impudent creature where is nauseous and loathed i can't abide to write such filthy words once more write as i'd have you and question it not or i will spoil thy writing with this i will stab out those eyes that cause my mischief holds up the penknife oh lord i will so so let's see now reads though i suffered last night your nauseous loathed kisses and embraces go on yet i would not have you presume that you shall ever repeat them so she writes i have writ it on then i then concealed myself from your knowledge to avoid your insolencies she writes so the same reason now i am out of your hands she writes so makes me own to you my unfortunate though innocent frolic of being in man's clothes she writes so that you may for evermore cease to pursue her who hates and detests you she writes on so hi <sighs> what do you sigh detests you as much as she loves her husband and her honour i vow husband he'll ne'er believe i should write such a letter what he'd expect a kinder from you come now your name only what shan't i say your most faithful humble servant till death no tormenting fiend aside her style i find would be very soft aloud come wrap it up now whilst i go fetch wax and a candle and write on the back side for mr horner exit for mr horner so i'm glad he has told me his name dear mr horner but why should i send thee such a letter that will vex thee and make thee angry with me well i will not send it 
Ay, but then my husband will kill me. For I see plainly he won't let me love Mr. Horner. But what care I for my husband? I won't, so I won't, sent poor Mr. Horner such a letter. But then my husband. But, oh, what if I writ at bottom my husband made me write it? Ay, but then my husband would see it. Can one have no shift? Ah, a London woman would have had a hundred presently. Stay. What if I should write a letter and wrap it up like this and write upon it too? Ay, but then my husband would see it. Oh, I don't know what to do. But yet, if I'll try, so I will. For I will not send this letter to poor Mr. Horner. Come what will on Writes and repeats what she writes. Dear sweet Mr. Horner, so, my husband would have sent you a base, rude, unmannerly letter, but I won't. So, and would have me forbid you loving me, but I won't. So, and would have me say to you, I hate you, poor Mr. Horner, but I won't tell a lie for him. There, for I'm sure if you and I were in the country at cards together, so... I could not help treading on your toe under the table. So? Or rubbing knees with you and staring in your face till you saw me. Very well. And then looking down and blushing for an hour together. So? But I must make haste before my husband comes, and now he has taught me to write letters, you shall have longer ones for me, who am dear, dear, poor, Dear Mr. Horner, your most humble friend and servant to command till death, Marjorie Pinchwife. Stay, I must give him a hint at bottom. So, now wrap it up just like t'other. So, now write for Mr. Horner. But, oh, now, what shall I do with it? For here comes my husband. Re-enter Pinchwife. Pinchwife aside. I have been detained by a sparkish coxcomb who pretended a visit to me, but I fear twas to my wife. Aloud. What? Have you done? I, I, but just now. Let's see it. What you tremble for? What? You would not have it go? Here. Aside. No, I must not give him that, so I had been served if I had given him this. He opens and reads the first letter. <sighs> <laughs> Come, where's the waxen seal? Mrs. Pinchwife, aside. Lord, what shall I do now? Nay, then I have it. Aloud. Pray let me see it. Lord, you think me so arrant a fool, I cannot seal a letter. I will do it, so I will. Snatches the letter from him, changes it for the other, seals it, and delivers it to him. Nay, I believe you will learn that, and other things too, which I would not have you. So, han't I done it curiously? Aside. I think I have. There's my letter going to Mr. Horner, since he'll needs have me send letters to folks. Tis very well, but I warrant you would not have it go now. Yes, indeed, but I would, but now. Well, you are a good girl, then. Come. Let me lock you up in your chamber till I come back, and be sure you come not within three strides of the window when I am gone, for I have a spy in the street. Exit Mrs. Pinchwife. Pinchwife locks the door. At least tis fit she thinks so. If we do not cheat women, they'll cheat us, and fraud may be justly used with secret enemies, of which a wife is the most dangerous. And he that has a handsome one to keep, and a frontier town— must provide against treachery rather than open force. Now I have secured all within, I'll deal with the foe without, with false intelligence. Holds up the letter. Exit. Scene three. Horner's lodging. Enter Horner and Quack. Well, sir, how fadges the new design? Have you not the luck of all your brother projectors? To deceive only yourself at last. No, good domine doctor, I deceive you, it seems, and others too, for the grave matrons and old rigid husbands think me as unfit for love as they are. 
but their wives, sisters, and daughters know some of them better things already. Already? Already, I say. Last night I was drunk with half a dozen of your civil persons, as you call them, and people of honour, and so was made free of their society and dressing rooms for ever hereafter. And I'm already come to the privileges of sleeping upon their pallets, warming smocks, tying shoes and garters and the like, Doctor. Already, already, Doctor. You have made good use of your time, sir. I tell thee, I am now no more interruption to him when they sing or talk body than a little squab French page who speaks no English. <laughs> but do civil persons and women of honour drink and sing bawdy songs? Oh, <laughs> amongst friends, amongst friends. For your bigots and honour are just like those in religion. They fear the eye of the world more than the eye of heaven, and think there is no virtue but railing at vice, and no sin but giving scandal. They rail at a poor little kept player, and keep themselves some young, modest pulpit comedian to be privy to their sins in their closets, not to tell em of them in their chapels. Nay, the truth on is, priests amongst the women now have quite got the better of us lay confessors physicians and they are rather their patients but enter lady fidget looking about her now we talk of women of honour here comes one step behind the screen there and but observe if i have not particular privileges with the women of reputation already doctor already quack retires well honour am not i a woman of honour you see i'm as good as my word and you shall see, madam, I'll not be behind hand with you in honour, and I'll be as good as my word too, if you please but to withdraw into the other room. But first, my dear sir, you must promise to have a care of my dear honour. If you talk a word more of your honour, you'll make me incapable to wrong it. To talk of honour in the mysteries of love is like talking of heaven or the deity in an operation of witchcraft just when you are employing the devil. It makes the charm impotent. Nay, fie, let us not be smutty. But you talk of mysteries and bewitching to me. I don't understand you. I tell you, madam, the word money in a mistress's mouth, at such a nick of time, is not a more disheartening sound to a younger brother than that of honour to an eager lover like myself. But you can't blame a lady of my reputation to be cherry. Cherry? <laughs> I have been chary of it already, by the report I have caused of myself. Ay, but if you should ever let other women know that dear secret, it would come out. Nay, you must have a great care of your conduct, for my acquaintance are so censorious. Oh, tis a wicked censorious world, Mr. Horner. I say, are so censorious and detracting, that perhaps they'll talk to the prejudice of my honour, though you should not let them know the dear secret. Nay, madam, rather than they shall prejudice your honour, I'll prejudice theirs. And to serve you, I'll lie with them all, make the secret their own, and then they'll keep it. I am a Machiavel in love, madam. Oh, no, sir, not that way. Nay, the devil take me if censorious women are to be silenced any other way. A secret is better kept, I hope, by a single person than a multitude. Therefore, pray do not trust anybody else with it, dear, dear Mr. Horner. Embracing him. Enter Sir Jasper Fidget. How now? Lady Fidget aside. Oh, my husband! Prevented! And what's almost as bad, found with my arms about another man. That will appear too much. What shall I say? Aloud. Sir Jasper, come hither. I am trying if Mr. Horner were ticklish, and he's as ticklish as can be. I love to torment the confounded toad. Let you and I tickle him. No, your ladyship will tickle him better without me, I suppose. But is this your buying china? I thought you'd been at the china house. Horner, aside. China house? Huh, that's my cue. I must take it. Aloud. A pox. Can't you keep your impertinent wives at home? Some men are troubled with the husbands, but I with the wives. 
but I'd have you to know, since I cannot be your journeyman by night, I will not be your drudge by day, to squire your wife about, and be your man of straw, or scarecrow only to pies and jays that would be nibbling at your forbidden fruit. I shall be shortly the hackney gentleman usher of the town. Sir Jasper aside. He, 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 poor fellow, he's in the right, Aunt Faith. To squire women about for other folks is as ungrateful an employment as to tell money for other folks. Aloud. He, 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 bent angry, Horner. No, tis I have more reason to be angry, who am left by you, to go abroad indecently alone, or, what is more indecent, to pin myself upon such ill-bred people of your acquaintance as this is. Nay, prithee, what has he done? Nay, he has done nothing. But what do you take ill, if he has done nothing? Ah, ha, ha. Faith, I can't but laugh, however. Why do you think the unmannerly toad would come down to me to the coach? I was fain to come up to fetch him, or go without him, which I was resolved not to do, for he knows China very well, and has himself very good, but will not let me see it, lest I should beg some, but I will find it out, and have what I came for yet. Horner, apart to Lady Fidget, as he follows her to the door. Lock the door, madam. Exit Lady Fidget, and locks the door. Aloud. So, she has got into my chamber and locked me out. Oh, the impertinency of womankind. Well, Sir Jasper, plain dealing is a jewel. If ever you suffer your wife to trouble me again here, she shall carry you home a pair of horns. By my lord mayor she shall, though I cannot furnish you myself, you are sure, yet I'll find a way. Ha, ha, ha. Aside. At my first coming in and finding her arms about him, tickling him, it seems, I was half jealous. But now I see my folly. Aloud. He, 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 poor Horner. Nay, though you laugh now, twill be my turn ere long. Oh, women, more impertinent, more cunning, and more mischievous than their monkeys, and to me almost as ugly. Now is she throwing my things about and rifling all I have, but I'll get into her the back way, and so rifle her for it. Ha, 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 poor angry Horner. Stay here a little. I'll ferret her out to you presently, I want. Exit at the other door. Sir Jasper talks through the door to his wife. She answers from within. Wife! My lady Fidget! Wife! He is coming into you the back way. Let him come and welcome, which way he will. He'll catch you and use you roughly and be too strong for you. Don't you trouble yourself. Let him if he can. Quack! Aside! This indeed I could not have believed from him, nor any but mine own eyes. Enter Mrs. Squeamish. Where is this woman hater, this toad, this ugly, greasy, dirty sloven? Sir Jasper aside. So the women all will have him ugly. Methinks he is a comely person. But his wants make his form contemptible to him. And tis e'en as my wife said yesterday, talking of him, that a proper handsome eunuch was as ridiculous a thing as a gigantic coward. Sir Jasper, your servant, where is the odious beast? He's within, in his chamber, with my wife. She's playing the wag with him. Is she so? And he's a clownish beast. He'll give her no quarter. He'll play the wag with her again. Let me tell you. Come, let's go help her. What? The door's locked. Aye, my wife locked it. Did she so? Let's break it open, then. No, no. He'll do her no hurt. Mrs. Squeamish aside. <sighs> But is there no other way to get into them? Whither goes this? I will disturb them. Exit at another door. Enter old lady squeamish. Where is this harlotry, this impudent baggage, this rambling tomrig? 
Oh, Sir Jasper, I'm glad to see you here. Did you not see my vile grandchild come in hither just now? Yes. Aye, but where is she then? Where is she? Lord Sir Jasper, I've even rattled myself to pieces in pursuit of her. But can you tell me what she makes here? They say below, no woman lodges here. No. No? What does she here then? Say, if it be not a woman's lodging, what makes she here? But are you sure no woman lodges here? No, nor no man neither. This is Mr. Horner's lodging. Is it so, are you sure? Yes, yes. So, then there's no hurt in it, I hope. But where is he? He's in the next room with my wife. Nay, if you trust him with your wife, I may with my biddy. They say he's a merry harmless man now. E'en as harmless a man as ever came out of Italy with a good voice. And is pretty harmless company for a lady. As a snake without his teeth. Aye, aye, poor man. Re-enter Mrs. Squeamish. Oh, I can't find them. Oh, are you here, grandmother? I followed, you must know, my lady Fidget hither. Tis the prettiest lodging, and I have been staring on the prettiest pictures. Re-enter lady Fidget with a piece of china in her hand, and Horner following. And I have been toiling and moiling for the prettiest piece of china, my dear. Oh, nay, she has been too hard for me, do what I could. Oh, Lord, I'll have some china too. Good Mr. Horner, don't think to give other people china and me none. Come in with me too. <laughs> Upon my honour, I have none left now. Nay, nay, I have known you deny your china before now, but you shan't put me off so. Come. <laughs> this lady had the last there. Yes, indeed, madam. To my certain knowledge, he has no more left. Oh, but it may be he may have some you could not find. What? Do you think if he had had any left, I would not have had it too? For we women of quality never think we have china enough. Uh, do not take it ill. Uh, I cannot make china for you all, uh, but I will have a roll wagon for you too, uh, another time. Thank you, dear Toad. Lady Fidget aside to Horner. What do you mean by that promise? Horner aside to Lady Fidget. <laughs> Alas, she has an innocent, literal understanding. Poor Mr. Horner. He has enough to do to please you all, I see. Ha! Hi, madam. You see how they use me. Poor gentlemen, I pity you. I thank you, madam. I could never find pity but from such reverend ladies as you are. The young ones will never spare a man. Come, come, beast, and go dine with us, for we shall want a man... At Omber, after dinner. <laughs> That's all their use of me, madam, you see. Come, Sloven, i lead you to be sure of you. Pulls him by the cravat. Alas, poor man, how she tugs him. Kiss, kiss her. That's the way to make such a nice woman quiet. No, madam, that remedy is worse than the torment. They know I dare suffer anything rather than do it. Pretty kiss her, and I'll give you her picture in little that you admired so last night. Pretty do you? Well, nothing but that could bribe me. I love a woman only in effigy, and good painting as much as I hate them. Oh, I'll do it, for I could adore the devil well painted. Mwah. Foe, you filthy toad. Nay, now I've done jesting. Ha <laughs> I told you so. Oh, a kiss of his. Has no more hurt in it than one of my spaniels. <laughs> Nor no more good neither. Quack, aside. I will now believe anything he tells me. Enter Pinchwife. Oh, Lord, here's a man. Sir Jasper, my mask, my mask. I would not be seen here for the world. What? Not when I am with you. No, no, my honour. Let's be gone. 
oh, grandmother let's be gone make haste make haste i know not how he may censure us be found in the lodging of anything like a man away exeunt sir jasper fidget lady fidget old lady squeamish and mrs squeamish quack aside what's here another cuckold he looks like one and none else sure have any business with him well what brings my dear friend hither your impertinency my impertinency <laughs> why you gentlemen that have got handsome wives think you have a privilege of saying anything to your friends and are as brutish as if you were our creditors no sir i'll ne'er trust you in any way but why not dear jack why defied in me thou know'st so well because i know you so well haven't i been always thy friend honest jack always ready to serve thee in love or battle before thou wert married and am so still i believe so you would be my second now indeed well then dear jack why so unkind so grum so strange to me come prithee kiss me dear rogue Gad I was always, I say, and am still as much thy servant as... As I am yours, sir? What? You would send a kiss to my wife? Is that it? So there it is. A man can't show his friendship to a married man, but presently he talks of his wife to you. Prithee, let thy wife alone, and let thee and I be all one, as we were wont. What, thou art as shy of my kindness as a Lombard Street alderman of a courteous civility at Lockett's? but you are over kind to me as kind as if i were your cuckold already yet i must confess you ought to be kind and civil to me since i am so kind so civil to you as to bring you this look you there sir delivers him a letter what is it only a love letter sir from whom how this is from your wife reads hmm Mm, and, mm, mm. even from my wife sir am i not wondrous kind and civil to you now too aside but you'll not think her so horner aside <laughs> is this a trick of his or hers the gentleman's surprised i find what you expected a kinder letter no faith not i how could i uh, yes yes i'm sure you did a man so well made as you are must needs be disappointed if the women declare not their passion at first sight or opportunity horner aside but what should this mean stay the postscript reads aside be sure you love me whatsoever my husband says to the contrary and let him not see this lest he should come home and pinch me or kill my squirrel it seems he knows not what the letter contains come ne'er wonder at it so much <sighs> faith uh, i can't help it now i think i have deserved your infinite friendship and kindness and have showed myself sufficiently an obliging friend and husband am i not so to bring a letter from my wife to her gallant ay the devil take me art thou the most obliging kind friend and husband in the world <laughs> well you may be merry sir but in short i must tell you sir my honour will suffer no jesting what dost thou mean does the letter warrant a comment then no sir though i have been so civil a husband as to bring you a letter from my wife to let you kiss and court her to my face i will not be a cuckold sir i will not thou art mad with jealousy i never saw thy wife in my life but at the play yesterday and i know not if it was she or no i caught her kiss her i will not be a cuckold i say there will be danger in making me a cuckold why wert thou not well cured of thy last clap i wear a sword it should be taken from thee lest thou shouldst do thyself a mischief with it thou art mad man as mad as i am and as merry as you are i must have more reason from you ere we part i say again though you kissed and courted last night my wife in man's clothes as she confesses in her letter horner aside ha both she and i say you must not design it again for you have mistaken your woman as you have done your man 
corner aside. Oh, I understand something now. Aloud. Was that thy wife? Why wouldst thou not tell me twas she? Faith, my freedom with her was your fault, not mine. Pinchwife aside. Faith, so it was. Fie! I'd never do it to a woman before her husband's face, sure. But I had rather you should do to my wife before my face than behind my back, and that you shall never do. No, you will hinder me. If I would not hinder you, you see by her letter she would. Well, I must e'en acquiesce then, and be contented with what she writes. I'll assure you, twas voluntarily writ. I had no hand in it, you may believe me. I do believe thee, Faith. And believe her too, for she's an innocent creature, has no dissembling in her. And so fare you well, sir. Pray, however, present my humble service to her, and tell her I will obey her letter to a tittle, and fulfil her desires, be what they will, or with what difficulty soever I do it, and you shall be no more jealous of me, I warrant her, and you. Well then, fare you well, and play with any man's honour but mine, kiss any man's wife but mine, and welcome. Exit. <laughs> oh, doctor. It seems he has not heard the report of you. Or does not believe it. <laughs> oh, now, Doctor, what think you? Pray, let's see the letter. Reads the letter. Hmm. For, dear, love you. <laughs> oh, I wonder how she could contrive it. What sayest thou to it? <laughs> Tis an original. So are your cuckolds too original. For they are like no other common cuckolds, and I will henceforth believe it not impossible for you to cuckold the Grand Seigneur amidst his guard of eunuchs, that I say. And I say for the letter, tis the first love letter that ever was without flames, darts, fates, destinies, lying and dissembligant. Enter Sparkish, pulling in Pinchwife. Come back. You are a pretty brother-in-law. Neither go to church nor to dinner with your sister bride. My sister denies her marriage, and you see has gone away from you, dissatisfied. Pshaw! Upon a foolish scruple, that our parson was not in lawful orders, and did not say all the common prayer. But tis her modesty only, I believe. But let all women be never so modest the first day, they'll be sure to come to themselves by night, and I shall have enough of her then. In the meantime, Harry Horner, you must dine with me. I keep my wedding at my aunt's in the piazza. Thy wedding? What stale maid has lived to despair of a husband? Or what young one of a gallant? Oh, your servant, sir. This gentleman's sister, then. No stale maid. I'm sorry for it. Pinchwife aside. How comes he's so concerned for her? You're sorry for it? Why, do you know any ill by her? No, I know none but by thee. Tis for her sake, not yours, and another man's sake that might have hoped, I thought. Another man? Another man? What is his name? Nay, since tis past, he shall be nameless. Aside. Poor Harcourt, I am sorry thou hast missed her. Pinchwife aside. He seems to be much troubled at the match. Prithee, tell me. Nay, you shan't go, brother. I must of necessity, but I'll come to you to dinner. Exit. But, Harry, what, have I a rival in my wife already? But with all my heart, for he may be of use to me hereafter, for though my hunger is now my sauce, and I can fall on heartily without, the time will come when a rival will be as good sauce for a married man to a wife as an orange to veal. Oh, thou damned rogue! Thou hast set my teeth on edge with thy orange. Then let's to dinner. There I was with you again. Come. But who dines with thee? My friends and relations. My brother Pinchwife, you see, of your acquaintance. And his wife? No, Gad. He'll ne'er let her come amongst us good fellows. Your stingy county coxcomb keeps his wife from his friends, 
as he does his little firkin of ale for his own drinking, and a gentleman can't get a smack on it. But his servants, when his back is turned, broach it at their pleasures and dust it away. <laughs> Gad, I am witty, I think, considering I was married today by the world. But come. No, I will not dine with you unless you can fetch her too. Be sure. What pleasure canst thou have with women now, Harry? My eyes are not gone. I love a good prospect yet, and will not dine with you unless she does too. Go fetch her, therefore, but do not tell her husband, tis for my sake. Well, I'll go try what I can do. In the meantime, come away to my aunt's lodging. Tis in the way to pinch wife's. The poor woman has called for aid, and stretched forth her hand, doctor. I cannot but help her over the pail out of the briars. Exeunt. Scene 4. A room in Pinchwife's house. Mrs. Pinchwife alone, leaning on her elbow. A table, pen, ink, and paper. Well, tis even so. I got the London disease they call love. I am sick of my husband, and for my gallant. I have heard this distemper called a fever, but methinks tis like an egg, for when I think of my husband I tremble, and I am in a cold sweat, and have inclinations to vomit. But when I think of my gallant, dear Mr. Horner, my hot fit comes, and I am all in a fever indeed. And, as in other fevers, my own chamber is tedious to me, and I would fain be removed to his, and then methinks I should be well. Ah, oh, poor Mr. Horner! Well, I cannot, will not stay here. Therefore I'll make an end of my letter to him, which shall be a finer letter than my last, because I have studied it like anything. Oh, sick, sick! Takes the pen and writes. Enter Pinchwife, who, seeing her writing, steals softly behind her and, looking over her shoulder, snatches the paper from her. What? Writing more letters? Oh, Lord, but... What, you fright me so. She offers to run out. He stops her and reads. How's this? Nay, you shall not stir, madam. Dear, dear, dear Mr. Horner. Very well, I have taught you to write letters to good purpose, but let us see it. First, I am to beg your pardon for my boldness in writing to you, which I'd have you to know I would not have done had not you said first you loved me so extremely, which if you do, you will never suffer me to lie in the arms of another man whom I loathe, nauseate, and detest. Now you can write these filthy words, but what follows? Therefore, I hope you will speedily find some way to free me from this unfortunate match, which was never, I assure you, of my choice. But I'm afraid tis already too far gone. However, if you love me as I do you, you will try what you can do. But you must help me away before tomorrow, or else, alas... I shall be forever out of your reach, for I can defer no longer our... our... What is to follow our? Speak! What? Our journey into the country, I suppose. Oh, woman, damned woman, and love, damned love, their own tempter, for this is one of his miracles. In a moment he can make those blind that could see, and those see that were blind, those dumb that could speak, and those prattle who were dumb before. Nay, what is more than all, make these dough-baked, senseless, indecile animals women, too hard for us, their politic lords and rulers, in a moment. But make an end of your letter, and then I'll make an end of you thus, and all my plagues together. Draws his sword. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, you are such a passionate man, bud. Enter Sparkish. Oh, now, what's here to do? This fool here now. What, drawn upon your wife? You should never do that, but at night in the dark when you can't hurt her. This is my sister-in-law, is it not? Aye, faith, in our country Marjorie. Pulls aside her handkerchief. One may know her. Come, 
She and you must go dine with me. Dinner's ready. Come. But where's my wife? Is she not come home yet? Where is she? Making you a cuckold. Tis what they all do as soon as they can. What? The wedding day? No. A wife that designs to make a collie of her husband will be sure to let him win the first stake of love by the world. But come. They stay dinner for us. Come. I'll lead down our Marjorie. No. Sir, go. We'll follow you. I will not wag without you. Pinchwife aside. This coxcomb is a sensible torment to me amidst the greatest in the world. Come, come, Madam Marjorie. No, I'll lead her my way. What, you would treat your friends with mine for want of your own wife? Leads her to the other door and locks her in and returns. Aside. I am contented my rage should take breath. I told Horner this. Come now. Lord, how shy you are of your wife. But let me tell you, brother, we men of wit have amongst us a saying, that cuckolding, like the smallpox, comes with a fear, and you may keep your wife as much as you will out of danger of infection, but if your constitution incline her to it, she'll have it sooner or later by the world, say they. Pinch wife aside. What a thing is a cuckold that every fool can make him ridiculous. Aloud. Well, sir, but let me advise you, now you are come to be concerned because you suspect the danger, not to neglect the means to prevent it, especially when the greatest share of the malady will light upon your own head. For how sad the kind wife's belly comes to swell, the husband breeds for her, and first is ill. Exeunt. End of Act 4 Act 5 of The Country Wife by William Witcherly Scene 1. Pinchwife's House Enter Pinchwife and Mrs. Pinchwife. A table and candle. Come, take the pen and make an end of the letter, just as you intended. If you are false in a tittle, I shall soon perceive it and punish you as you deserve. Lays his hand on the sword. Write what was to follow. Let's see. You must make haste and help me away before tomorrow, or else I shall be forever out of your reach, for I can defer no longer our... What follows our? Must all out then, bud? Look you there, then. Mrs. Pinchwife takes the pen and writes. Let's see. For I can defer no longer our... wedding? Your slighted Alethea. What's the meaning of this? My sister's name to it. Speak! Unriddle! Yes, indeed, bud. But why her name to it? Speak! Speak, I say! Ay, but you'll tell her then again? If you would not tell her again... I will not. I am stunned. My head turns round. Speak! Won't you tell her indeed and indeed? No! Speak, I say! She'll be angry with me, but I had rather she should be angry with me than you, Bud. And to tell you the truth, twas she made me write the letter and taught me what I should write. Pinchwife, aside. Ha! I thought the style was somewhat better than her own. Aloud. Could she come to you, to teach you, since I had locked you up, alone? Oh, through the keyhole, Bud. But why should she make you write a letter for her to him, since she can write herself? Why, she said, because... for I was unwilling to do it. Because what? Because... Because, lest Mr. Horner should be cruel and refuse her, or be vain afterwards and show the letter, she might disown it, the hand not being hers. Pinchwife aside. How's this? Ha! Then I think I shall come to myself again. This changeling could not invent this lie. But if she could, why should she? She might think I should soon discover it. Stay. Now I think on too. Horner said he was sorry she had married Sparkish, and her disowning her marriage to me makes me think she has evaded it for Horner's sake. Yet why should she take this course? But men in love are fools. Women may well be so. Aloud. But hark you, madam, your sister went out in the morning, and I have not seen her within since. 
Alack a day, she has been crying all day above, it seems, in a corner. Where is she? Let me speak with her. Mrs. Pinchwife, aside. Oh, Lord, then she'll discover all. Aloud. Pray hold, bud. What, do you mean to discover me? She'll know I have told you then. Pray, bud, let me talk with her first. Yes, well, I must speak with her to know whether Horner ever made her any promise, and whether she be married to Sparkish or no. Pray, dear bud, don't, till I have spoken with her, and told her that I have told you all, for she'll kill me else. Go, then, and bid her come out to me. Yes, yes, bud. Let me see. Pausing. Mrs. Pinchwife aside. I'll go, but she's not within to come to him. Ah, I have just got time to know of Lucy, her maid, who first set me on work, what lie I shall tell next, for I am e'en at my wit's end. Exit. Well, I resolve it. Horner shall have her. I'd rather give him my sister than lend him my wife. And such an alliance will prevent his pretensions to my wife, sure. I'll make him of kin to her, then he won't care for her. <laughs> Re-enter Mrs. Pinchwife. Oh, Lord, Bud, I told you what anger you would make me with my sister. Won't she come hither? No, no. Lack a day, she's ashamed to look you in the face, and she says if you go into her, she'll run away downstairs and shamefully go herself to Mr. Horner, who has promised her marriage, she says, and she will have no other, so she won't. Did he so? Promise her marriage? Then she shall have no other. Go tell her so, and if she will come and discourse with me a little concerning the means, I will about it immediately. Go. Exit Mrs. Pinchwife. His estate is equal to Sparkish's, and his extraction as much better than his as his parts are. But my chief reason is, I'd rather be akin to him by the name of brother-in-law than that of Cuckold. Re-enter Mrs. Pinchwife. Well, what says she now? Why, she says she would only have you lead her to Horner's lodging, with whom she first will discourse the matter before she talks with you, which yet she cannot do. For, alack, poor creature, she says she can't so as much as look you in the face, therefore she'll come to you in a mask. And you must excuse her if she make you no answer to any question of yours, till you have brought her to Mr. Horner, and if you will not chide her, nor question her, she'll come out to you immediately. <laughs> Let her come. I will not speak a word to her, nor require a word from her. Oh, I forgot. Besides, she says, she cannot look you in the face, though through a mask. Therefore, would desire you to put out the candle. I agree to all. Let her make haste. There, tis out. Exit Mrs. Pinchwife. My case is something better. I'd rather fight with Horner for not lying with my sister than for lying with my wife. And, of the two, I'd rather find my sister too forward than my wife. I expected no other from her free education, as she calls it, and her passion for the town. Well, wife and sister are names which make us expect love and duty, pleasure and comfort. But we find them plagues and torments, and are equally, though differently, troublesome to their keeper. But we have as much ado to get people to lie with our sisters as to keep them from lying with our wives. Re-enter Mrs. Pinchwife masked, and in hoods and scarfs, and a nightgown and petticoat of Alethea's. What are you come, sister? Let us go, then. But first, let me lock up my wife. Mrs. Marjorie, where are you? Here, bud. Come hither, that I may lock you up. Get you in. Locks the door. Come, sister. Where are you now? Mrs. Pinchwife gives him her hand, but when he lets her go... She steals softly on to the other side of him, and is led away by him for his sister Alethea. Scene 2. Horner's Lodging. Horner and Quack. What? All alone? Not so much as one of your cuckolds here, nor one of their wives. They used to take their turns with you, as if they were to watch you. 
Yes, it often happens that a cuckold is but his wife's spy, and is more upon family duty when he is with a gallant abroad, hindering his pleasure, than when he is at home with her playing the gallant. But the hardest duty a married woman imposes upon a lover is keeping her husband company always. And his fondness wearies you almost as soon as hers. A pox! Keeping a cuckold company after you've had his wife is as tiresome as the company of a country squire to a witty fellow of the town when he has got all his money. And as at first a man makes a friend of the husband to get the wife, so at last you are fain to fall out with the wife to be rid of the husband. Ay, most cuckold makers are true courtiers. When once the poor man has cracked his credit for him, they can't abide to come near him. But at first, to draw him in, are so sweet, so kind, so dear, just as you are to pinch wife. But what becomes of that intrigue with his wife? A uh, pox. He's as surly as an alderman that has been bit, and since he's so coy, his wife's kindness is in vain, for she's a silly innocent. Did she not send you a letter by him? Yes, but that's a riddle I have not yet solved. Allow the poor creature to be willing. She is silly too, and he keeps her up so close. Yes, so close that he makes her but the more willing, and adds but revenge to her love which two when met seldom fail of satisfying each other one way or other what here's the man we are talking of i think enter pinchwife leading in his wife masked muffled and in her sister's gown pshaw bringing his wife to you is the next thing to bringing a love letter from her what means this the last time you know, sir, I brought you a love letter. Now, you see, a mistress. I think you'll say I'm a civil man to you. Ay, the devil take me. Will I say thou art the civilest man I ever met with? But I have known some. I fancy I understand thee now better than I did the letter. But hark thee in thy ear. What? Nothing but the usual question, man. Is she sound on thy word? What, do you take her for a wench and me for a pimp? <laughs> wench and pimp, poor words. I know thou art an honest fellow, and hast a great acquaintance among the ladies, and perhaps hast made love for me rather than let me make love to thy wife. Come, sir, in short, I'm for no fooling. Nor I neither. Therefore, pretty, let's see her face presently. Make a showman. Art thou sure I don't know her? I'm sure you do know her. Ah, Pox! Why dost thou bring her to me, then? Because she's a relation of mine. Is she faith, man? Then thou art still more civil and obliging, dear rogue. Who desired me to bring her to you? Then she is obliging, dear rogue. You'll make her welcome for my sake, I hope. I hope she is handsome enough to make herself welcome. Prithee, let her unmask. Do you speak to her? She would never be ruled by me. Madam... Mrs. Pinchwife whispers to Horner. She says she must speak with me in private. Withdraw, prithee. Pinchwife, aside. She's unwilling, it seems. I should know all her indecent conduct in this business. Aloud. Well, then, I'll leave you together, and hope when I'm gone you'll agree. If not, you and I shan't agree, sir. What means the fool? If she and I agree, it is no matter what you and I do whispers to Mrs. Pinchwife, who makes signs with her hand for him to be gone. In the meantime, I'll fetch a parson and find out Sparkish and disabuse him. You would have me fetch a parson, would you not? Well, then, now I think I am rid of her and shall have no more trouble with her. Our sisters and daughters, like usurers' money, are safest when put out. But our wives, like their writings, never safe but in our closets under lock and key. Exit. Enter boy. Sir Jasper Fidget, sir, is coming up. Exit. Here's the trouble of a cuckold now we are talking of. A pox on him. He has not enough to do to hinder his wife's sport, but he must other women's too. Step in here, madam. 
Exit Mrs. Pinchwife. Enter Sir Jasper Fidget. My best and dearest friend. Horner aside to Quack. The old style, Doctor. Aloud. Well, be short, for I am busy. What would your impertinent wife have now? Well, guest in faith, for I do come from her. To invite me to supper? Tell her I can't come. Go. Nay, now you are out, faith, for my lady, and the whole knot of the virtuous gang, as they call themselves, are resolved upon a frolic of coming to you tonight in masquerade, and are all dressed already. I shan't be at home. Sir Jasper aside. Lord, how churlish she is to women. Aloud. Nay, prithee, don't disappoint them. They'll think tis my fault. Prithee, don't. I'll send in the banquet down the fiddles. But make no noise, aunt, for the poor virtuous rogues would not have it known for the world that they go a masquerading, and they would come to no man's ball but yours. Well, well, get you gone, and tell him if they come, twill be at the peril of their honour and yours. <laughs> we'll trust you for that. Farewell. Exit. Doctor, anon you too shall be my guest, but now I'm going to a private feast. Exeunt. Scene three, the piazza of Covent Garden. Enter Sparkish with a letter in his hand, Pinchwife following. But who would have thought a woman could have been false to me? By the world, I could not have thought it. You were forgiving in taking liberty. She has taken it only, sir, now you find in that letter. You are a frank person, and so is she. You see there. Uh, nay, if this be her hand, for I never saw it. "'Tis no matter whether that be your hand or no. "'I'm sure this hand at her desire led her to Mr. Horner, "'with whom I left her just now to go fetch a parson to him at their desire too, "'to deprive you of her for ever. "'For it seems yours was but a mock marriage.' "'Indeed. "'She would needs have it that was Harcourt himself, "'in a parson's habit, that married us. "'But I'm sure he told me twas his brother Ned.' Oh, there tis out, and you were deceived, not she, for you are such a frank person. But I must be gone. You'll find her at Mr. Horner's. Go and believe your eyes. Exit. Nay, I'll to her, and call her as many crocodiles, sirens, harpies, and other heathenish names as a poet would do to a mistress who would refuse to hear his suit, nay more, his verses on her. But stay, is not that she following a torch at the other end of the piazza? And from Horner's, certainly. Tis so. Enter Alethea following a torch, and Lucy behind. You are well met, madam, though you don't think so. What, you have made a short visit to Mr. Horner? But I suppose you'll return to him presently. By that time, the parson can be with him. Mr. Horner and the parson, sir. Come, madam, no more dissembling, no more jilting. For I am no more a frank person. How's this? Lucy aside. So, <laughs> to will work, I see. Could you find out no easy country fool to abuse? None but me, a man of wit and pleasure about the town? But it was your pride to be too hard for a man of parts, unworthy false woman. False as a friend that lends man money to lose. False as dice who undo those that trust all they have to em. Lucy aside. He has been a great bubble, by his similes, as they say. You have been too merry, sir, at your wedding dinner, sure. What, do you mock me, too? Or you have been deluded. By you? Let me understand you. Have you the confidence, I should call it something else, since you know your guilt, to stand my just reproaches? You did not write an impudent letter to Mr. Horner? who I find now has clubbed with you in deluding me with his aversion for women, that I might not, forsooth, suspect him for my rival? Lucy, aside. Do you think the gentleman can be jealous now, madam? I write a letter to Mr. Horner. Nay, madam, do not deny it. Your brother showed it me just now, and told me likewise. He left you at Horner's lodging to fetch a parson to marry you to him. 
and I wish you joy, madam, joy, joy, and to him too much joy, and to myself more joy for not marrying you. Alethea aside. So I find my brother would break off the match, and I can consent to it, since I see this gentleman can be made jealous. Aloud. Oh, Lucy, by his rude usage and jealousy, he makes me almost afraid I am married to him. Art thou sure twas Harcourt himself, and no parson that married us? No, madam, I thank you. I suppose that was a contrivance, too, of Mr. Horner's and yours, to make Harcourt play the parson? But I would as little as you have him one now. No, not for the world. For shall I tell you another truth? I never had any passion for you till now, for now I hate you. Tis true, I might have married your portion, as other men of parts of the town do sometimes, and so your servant. And to show my unconcernedness, I'll come to your wedding, and resign you with as much joy as I would a stale wench to a new cully. Nay, with as much joy as I would after the first night if I had been married to you. There's for you. And so, your servant, servant. Exit. How was I deceived in a man? You believe then a fool may be made jealous now? For that easiness in him that suffers him to be led by a wife would likewise permit him to be persuaded against her by others. But marry Mr. Horner. My brother does not intend it, sure. If I thought he did, I would take thy advice, and Mr. Harcourt for my husband. And now I wish that if there be any over-wise women of the town who, like me, would marry a fool for fortune, liberty, or title first, that her husband may love play and be a cully to all the town but her, and suffer none but fortune to be mistress of his purse, then, if for liberty, that he may send her into the country, under the conduct of some huswifely mother-in-law, and, if for title, may the world give him none but that of cuckold. And for her a greater curse, madam, may he not deserve it. Away, impertinent! Is not this my old lady Lantaloos? Yes, madam. Aside. And here I hope we shall find Mr. Harcourt. Exeunt. Scene four. Horner's lodging. A table, banquet, and bottles. Enter Horner, Lady Fidget, Mrs. Dainty Fidget, and Mrs. Squeamish. Horner, aside. A pox! They are come too soon, before I have sent back my new mistress. All that I have now to do is to lock her in, that they may not see her. That we may be sure of our welcome, we have brought our entertainment with us, and are resolved to treat thee, dear Toad. And that we may be merry to purpose, have left Sir Jasper and my old Lady Squeamish quarrelling at home at Backgammon. Therefore, let us make use of our time, lest they should chance to interrupt us. Let us sit, then. First, that you may be private, let me lock this door in that, and I'll wait upon you presently. No, sir, shut em only, and your lips for ever, for we must trust you as much as our women. You know all vanity is killed in me. I have no occasion for talking. Now, ladies, supposing we had drank each of us our two bottles, let us speak the truth of our hearts. Agreed. Agreed. By this brimmer, for truth is nowhere else to be found. Aside to Horner. Not in thy heart, false man. Horner, aside to Lady Fidget. You have found me a true man, I'm sure. Lady Fidget, aside to Horner. Not every way, but let us sit and be merry. Sings. Why should our damned tyrants oblige us to live on the pittance of pleasure which they only give? We must not rejoice with wine and with noise. In vain we must wake in a dull bed alone, whilst to our warm rival the bottle they're gone. Then lay aside charms and take up these arms. Tis wine only gives them their courage and wit. Because we live sober to men we submit. If for beauties you'd pass, take a lick of the glass. Twill mend your complexions, and when they are gone, the best red we have is the red of the grape. Then sisters lay it on, and damn a good shape. Dear Brimmer, well, in token of our openness and plain dealing, let us throw our masks over our heads. Horner aside. Sir, twill come to the glasses anon. Lovely Brimmer, let me enjoy him first. No, I never part with a gallant till I've tried him, dear Brimmer, that makest our husband short-sighted. And our bashful gallants bold. And for want of a gallant, 
the butler lovely in our eyes drink <laughs> eunuch drink the representative of a husband damn a husband and as it were a husband an old keeper <sighs> and an old grandmother and an english board and a french surgeon ay we have all reason to curse him for my sake ladies no for our own for the first spoils all young gallants industry and the other's art makes em bold only with common women and rather run the hazard of the vile distemper amongst them than of a denial amongst us the filthy toads choose mistresses now as they do stuffs for having been fancied and worn by others for being common and cheap whilst women of quality like the richest stuffs lie untumbled and unasked for ay neat and cheap and new often they think best no sir the beasts will be known by a mistress longer than by a suit and is not for cheapness neither no for the vain fops will take up druggets and embroider em but i wonder at the depraved appetites of witty men they used to be out of the common road and hate imitation pray tell me beast when you were a man why you rather chose to club with a multitude in a common house for an entertainment than to be the only guest at a good table why faith ceremony and expectation are unsufferable to those that are sharp bent people always eat with the best stomach at an ordinary where every man is snatching for the best bit though he get a cut over the fingers but i have heard that people eat most heartily of another man's meat that is what they do not pay for when they are sure of their welcome and freedom for ceremony in love and eating is as ridiculous as in fighting falling on briskly as all should be done on those occasions well then let me tell you sir there is nowhere more freedom than in our houses and we take freedom from a young person as a sign of good breeding and a person may be as free as he pleases with us as frolic as gamesome as wild as he will and i heard you all declaim against wild men yes but for all that we think wildness in a man as desirable a quality as in a duck or a rabbit a tame man for i know not but your reputations frightened me as much as your faces invited me our reputation lord why should you not think that we women make use of our reputation as you men of yours only to deceive the world with less suspicion our virtue is like the statesman's religion the quaker's word the gamester's oath and the great man's honour but to cheat those that trust us and that demureness coyness and modesty that you see in our faces in the boxes at plays is as much a sign of a kind woman as a wizard mask in the pit for i assure you women are least masked when they have the velvet wizard on you would have found us modest women in our denials only our bashfulness is only the reflection of the man's we blush when they are shamefaced i beg your pardon ladies i was deceived in you devilishly but why that mighty pretence to honour we have told you but sometimes twas for the same reason you men pretend business often to avoid ill company to enjoy the better and more privately those you love but why would you ne'er give a friend a wink then faith your reputation frightened us as much as ours did you you were so notoriously lewd and you so seemingly honest was that all that deterred you and so expensive you allow freedom you say ay ay that i was afraid of losing my little money as well as my little time both which my other pleasures required money fo you talk like a little fellow now do such as we expect money i beg your pardon madam i must confess i have heard that great ladies like great merchants set but the higher prices upon what they have because they are not in necessity of taking the first offer such as we make sale of our hearts we bribed for our love oh with your pardon ladies i know like great men in offices you seem to exact flattery and attendance only from your followers but you have receivers about you and such fees to pay a man is afraid to pass your grants besides we must let you in at cards or we lose your hearts 
and if you make an assignation, tis at a goldsmith's, jeweller's, or china house, where for your honour you deposit to him, he must pawn his to the punctual sit, and so paying for what you take up, pays for what he takes up. Would you not have us assured of our gallant's love? For love is better known by liberality than by jealousy. For one may be dissembled, the other not. Aside. But my jealousy can be no longer dissembled, and they are telling ripe. Aloud. Come, here's to our gallants in waiting, whom we must name, and I'll begin. This is my false rogue. Claps him on the back. How? Horner, aside. So, all will out now. Mrs. Squeamish, aside to Horner. <gasps> Did you not tell me... "'Twas for my sake only you reported yourself, no man? "'Mrs. Dainty Fidget, aside to Horner. "'Oh, wretch, did you not swear to me "'twas for my love and honour you passed for that thing you do?' "'So, so.' "'Come, speak, ladies, this is my false villain.' "'And mine, too.' "'And mine?' "'Well, then, you are all three my false rogues, too.' And there's an end on't. Well, then, there's no remedy. Sister Sharers, let us not fall out, but have a care of our honour. Though we get no presents, no jewels of him, we are savers of our honour, the jewel of most value and use, which shines yet to the world unsuspected, though it be counterfeit. Nay, and is e'en as good as if it were true, provided the world thinks so. For honour, like beauty now, only depends on the opinion of others. Well, Harry Common, I hope you can be true to three. Swear, but tis to no purpose to require your oath, for you are as often forsworn as you swear to new women. Come, faith, madam, let us e'en pardon one another. For all the difference I find betwixt we men and you women, we forswear ourselves at the beginning of an amour, you as long as it lasts. Enter Sir Jasper Fidget and old Lady Squeamish. Oh, my Lady Fidget, was this your cunning? to come to mr horner without me but you have been nowhere else i hope no sir jasper and you came straight hither biddy <sighs> yes indeed lady grandmother tis well tis well i knew when once they were thoroughly acquainted with poor horner they'd ne'er be from him you may let her masquerade it with my wife and horner and i warrant her reputation safe Enter, boy. Oh, sir, here's the gentleman come, who you bid me not to suffer to come up without giving you notice, with a lady, too, and other gentlemen. Do you all go in there, whilst I send him away? And, boy, do you desire him to stay below till I come, which shall be immediately? Exeunt Sir Jasper Fidget, Lady Fidget, Lady Squeamish, Mrs. Squeamish, and Mrs. Dainty Fidget. Yes, sir. Exit. Exits Horner at the other door, and returns with Mrs. Pinchwife. You would not take my advice to be gone home before your husband came back. He'll now discover all. Yet pray, my dearest, be persuaded to go home and leave the rest to my management. I'll let you down the back way. I don't know the way home, so I don't. My man shall wait upon you. No, don't you believe that I'll go at all? What, are you weary of me already? no my life tis that i may love you long tis to secure my love and your reputation with your husband he'll never receive you again else what care i do you think to frighten me with that i don't intend to go to him again you shall be my husband now i cannot be your husband dearest since you are married to him oh would you make me believe that don't I see every day at London here women leave their first husbands and go and live with other men as their wives? Pish, pshaw, you'd make me angry, but that I love you so mainly. So they are coming up. In again, in. I hear em. Exit, Mrs. Pinchwife. Well, a silly mistress is like a weak place. Soon got, soon lost. A man has scarce time for plunder. She betrays her husband first to a gallant. Then her gallant to her husband. Enter Pinchwife, Alethea, Harcourt, Sparkish, Lucy, and a parson. 
Come, madam, tis not the sudden change of your dress, the confidence of your asseverations, and your false witness there shall persuade me I did not bring you hither just now. Here's my witness, who cannot deny it, since you must be confronted. Mr. Horner, did I not bring this lady to you just now? Horner, aside. Now must I wrong one woman for another's sake. But that's no new thing with me, for in these cases I'm still on the criminal's side against the innocent. Pray speak, sir. Horner, aside. It must be so. I must be impudent and try my luck. Impudence uses to be too hard for truth. What, are you studying an evasion or excuse for her? Speak, sir. No, Faith. I am something backward only to speak in women's affairs or disputes. She bids you speak. I pray, sir, do. Pray satisfy him. Then truly, you did bring that lady to me just now. Oh, ho! How, sir? How, Horner? What mean you, sir? I always took you for a man of honour. Horner, aside. Ay, so much a man of honour that I must save my mistress, I thank you, come what will on't. So, if I had had her, she'd have made me believe the moon had been made of a Christmas pie. Lucy, aside. Now, could, could I speak if I durst, and solve the riddle, who I am the author of it? Oh, unfortunate women. A combination against my honour, which most concerns me now, because you share in my disgrace, sir, and it is your censure, which I must now suffer, that troubles me, not theirs. Madam, then have no trouble. You shall see now tis possible for me to love you too, without being jealous. I will not only believe your innocence myself, but make all the world believe it. Aside to Horner. Horner. I must now be concerned for this lady's honour. And I must be concerned for a lady's honour too. This lady has her honour, and I will protect it. My lady has not her honour, but has given it me to keep, and I will preserve it. I understand you not. I would not have you. Mrs. Pinchwipe peeping in behind. What's the matter with them all? Come, come, Mr. Horner, no more disputing. Here's the parson, I brought him not in vain. No, sir, I'll employ him, if this lady please. How? What do you mean? Aye, what does he mean? Why, I have resigned your sister to him. He has my consent. But he has not mine, sir. A woman's injured honour, no more than a man's, can be repaired or satisfied by any but him that first wronged it. And you shall marry her presently. Or oh! Lays his hand on the sword. Re-enter Mrs. Pinchwife. Oh, Lord, they'll kill poor Mr. Horner. Besides, he shan't marry her whilst I stand by and look on. I'll not lose my second husband so. What do I see? My sister in my clothes. Ha! Ah. Mrs. Pinchwife to Pinchwife. Nay, pray now don't quarrel about finding work for the parson. He shall marry me to Mr. Horner. Or now I believe you have enough of me. Horner aside. Damned, damned, loving changeling. Pray, sister, pardon me for telling so many lies of you. I suppose the riddle is plain now. No, that must be my work. Good sir, hear me. Kneels the pinchwife, who stands doggedly with his hat over his eyes. I will never hear a woman again, but make them all silent thus. Offers to draw upon his wife. No, that must not be. You then shall go first. Tis all one to me. Offers to draw on Horner, but is stopped by Harcourt. Hold. Re-enter Sir Jasper Fidget, Lady Fidget, Lady Squeamish, Mrs. Dainty Fidget, and Mrs. Squeamish. What's the matter? What's the matter? Pray, what's the matter, sir? I beseech you, communicate, sir. Why, my wife has communicated, sir, as your wife may have done too, sir, if she knows him, sir. Pshaw, with him? Ha, ha, ha. Do you mock me, sir? A cuckold is a kind of a wild beast. Have a care, sir. No, sure, you mock me, sir. He cuckold you? It can't be. <laughs> Why, I'll tell you, sir. Offers to whisper. 
I tell you again, he has whored my wife, and yours too, if he knows her, and all the women he comes near. Tis not his dissembling his hypocrisy can wheedle me. How does he dissemble? Is he a hypocrite? Nay, then, how, wife, sister, is he a hypocrite? A hypocrite? A dissembler? Speak, young harlotry, speak how? Nay, then, oh, my head too. O oh, thou libidinous lady! O oh, thou harloting harlotry! Hast thou done then? Speak, good horner. Art thou a dissembler, a rogue? Hast thou so? Lucy, apart to horner. I'll fetch you off, and her too, if she will but hold her tongue. Horner, apart to Lucy. Canst thou? I'll give thee. Lucy, to pinchwife. Pray have but the patience to hear me, sir, who am the unfortunate cause of all this confusion. Your wife is innocent, I only culpable, for I put her upon telling you all these lies concerning my mistress in order to the breaking off of the match between Mr. Sparkish and her to make way for Mr. Harcourt. Did you so, eternal rotten tooth? Then, it seems, my mistress was not false to me. I was only deceived by you. Brother that should have been, now a man of conduct, who is a frank person now, to bring your wife to her lover, ha? Huh? I assure you, sir, she came not to Mr. Horner out of love, for she loves him no more. Hold, I told lies for you, but you shall tell none for me, for I do love Mr. Horner with all my soul, and nobody shall say me nay. Pray, don't you go to make poor Mr. Horner believe to the contrary. Tis spitefully done of you, I'm sure. Horner, aside to Mrs. Pinchwife. Peace, dear idiot. Nay, I will not peace. Not till I make you. Enter Dorland and Quack. Horner, your servant. I am the doctor's guest. He must excuse our intrusion. But what's the matter, gentlemen? For heaven's sake, what's the matter? Oh, tis well you are come. Tis a censorious world we live in. You may have brought me a reprieve, or else I had died for a crime I never committed, and these innocent ladies had suffered with me. Therefore, pray satisfy these worthy, honourable, jealous gentlemen that— Whispers! Oh, I understand you. Is that all? Sir Jasper, by heavens, and upon the word of a physician, sir. Whispers to Sir Jasper. Nay, I do believe you truly. Pardon me, my virtuous lady and dear of honour. What? Then all's right again? Aye, aye, and now let us satisfy him too. They whisper with Pinchwife. An eunuch? Pray. No fooling with me. I'll bring half the Chirigans in town to swear it. They? They'll swear a man that bled to death through his wounds died of an apoplexy. Pray hear me, sir. Why, all the town has heard the report of him. But does all the town believe it? Pray inquire a little. And first of all these. I'm sure when I left the town he was the lewdest fellow in it. I tell you, sir, he has been in France since. Pray but ask these ladies and gentlemen, your friend Mr. Dorilant. Gentlemen and ladies, and you all heard the late sad report of poor Mr. Horner. Aye. Why, thou jealous fool, dost thou doubt it? He's an errant French capon. "'Tis false, sir. You shall not disparage poor Mr. Horner, for to my certain knowledge—' "'Oh, hold!' Mrs. Squeamish aside to Lucy. <gasps> "'Stop her mouth!' Lady Fidget to Pinchwife. "'Upon my honour, sir, tis as true. You think we would have been seen in his company? Trust our unspotted reputations with him?' Lady Fidget aside to Horner. This you get, and we too, by trusting your secret to a fool. Peace, madam. Aside to quack. Well, doctor, is not this a good design that carries a man on unsuspected and brings him off safe? Pinchwife aside. Well, if this were true, 
but my wife. Dorland whispers with Mrs. Pinchwife. Come, brother. Your wife is yet innocent, you see. But have a care of too strong an imagination, lest, like an over-concerned timorous gamester, by fancying an unlucky cast, it should come. Women and fortune are truest still to those that trust him. And any wild thing grows but the more fierce and hungry for being kept up, and more dangerous to the keeper. There's doctrine for all husbands, Mr. Harcourt. I edify, madam, so much that I am impatient till I am one. And I edify so much by example I will never be one. And because I will not disparage my parts, I'll ne'er be one. And I, alas, can't be one. But I must be one, against my will to a country wife, with a country moraine to me. Mrs. Pinchwife, aside. And I must be a country wife still, too, I find, for I can't, like a city one, be rid of my musty husband and do what I list. Now, sir, I must pronounce your wife innocent, though I blush whilst I do it. And I am the only man by her now exposed to shame which I will straight drown in wine, as you shall your suspicion, and the lady's troubles we'll divert with a ballad. Doctor, where are your maskers? Indeed, she's innocent, sir. I am her witness, and her end of coming out was but to see her sister's wedding. And what she said to your face of her love to Mr. Horner was but the usual innocent revenge on a husband's jealousy. Was it not, madam? Speak. Mrs. Pinchwife aside to Lucy and Horner. Since you'll have me tell more lies. Aloud. Yes, indeed, but... For my own sake fain I would all believe. Cuckolds like lovers should themselves deceive. But... His honour is least safe, too late I find, Who trusts it with a foolish wife or friend. A dance of cuckolds. Vain fops but court and dress, and keep a pother To pass for women's men with one another. But he who aims by women to be prized, First by the men, you see, must be despised. Exeunt. Epilogue. Now you, the vigorous, who daily hear Over visored mask in public domineer, And what you'd do to her if in place where, Nay, have the confidence to cry, Come out! Yet when she says lead on, you are not stout. But to your well-dressed brother straight turn round and cry pox on her, Ned, she can't be sound. Then slink away, a fresh one to engage, with so much seeming heat and loving rage, you'd frighten listening actress on the stage. Till she at last has seen you huffing come and talk of keeping in the tiring room, yet cannot be provoked to lead her home. Next, you Falstaffs of fifty who beset your buckram maidenheads, which your friends get, and whilst to them you of achievements boast, they share the booty and laugh at your cost. In fine, you essenced boys, both old and young, who would be thought so eager, brisk and strong, yet do the ladies not their husbands wrong, whose purses for your manhood make excuse, and keep your Flanders mares for show, not use. Encouraged by our woman's man today, a horner's part may vainly think to play and may intrigue so bashfully disown that they may doubt it be by few or none. May kiss the cards at piquet, ombre, lou, and so be taught to kiss the lady too. But gallants have a care, faith, what you do. The world which to no man his due will give, you by experience know you can deceive. And men may still believe you vigorous, but then we women, there's no cousining us. End of Act 5 End of The Country Wife by William Witcherly.